Happy Founders Day to you. That is if we can be happy about the state of affairs. This is the AM show coming your way this Friday, Founders Day. My name is Benjamin Akako. I'm going to be keeping you company over these four hours. Today, if you've ever missed any AM show, today, you want to stay with me on the AM show. Welcome aboard. Now, coming up shortly, we're going to be serving the news hot. And right after that, member of our political desk, Samuel Mbura, will be joining us for uh, the news review. And then we get into prime take with Muftau Nabila Abdullahi. And right after that, we get into our big stories. Uh, and uh, today, well, even before that, I it nearly skipped my own mind. I have put together a piece for you today, a piece that even I can beat my chest and say will be a classic. And people will go back to this. And I hope that our misleaders will actually pay attention to this. Today, for my blunt thoughts, I have titled it A Forced Haircut, A New Pipe Dream, and A Cycle of Wastage. Ghana on the ropes. That's the title. Stay with me for that. And then we get into our big stories. And of course, today we're going to be talking to you about Founders Day. We want to have a conversation, an all-encompassing. Of course, we can't cover every ground, but Ghana, where are we? What are our ideals? What should our destination be? And how do we get there? Join us with your thoughts on social media on uh, that bit. But also on the show, we'll be telling you about Joy Prime's Big Chef program. Big Chef Tertiary is a culinary reality show that airs on Joy Prime TV every Sunday at 5 p.m. And uh, this is the first episode of the Tertiary edition. This season has 18 candidates uh, from uh, different schools who will actually be competing for that uh, gong. We'll bring you details of uh, that. We've also got a conversation with Translight Solar uh, Company. They join us on uh, the show as uh, well. So you stick and stay with us on the AM uh, show as we also host the Graduate Students Association of Ghana, uh, University of Education, among others. We'll be right back on the AM show with the news up next. Good morning once again. Thank you for staying with us. It's time now for the AM News. In our first story, for the past two months, residents of Princess Town in Ahanta West have been cut off from the other parts of the municipality as the main bridge linking to the main Agona and Kwanta Elubu Road and the district's capital has collapsed. Despite their pleas, there has been no government intervention to rectify the issue. Here's what my colleague Samuel Kojo Brace captured. The impact of the collapsed bridge on the community has been immense. Farmers are seen struggling to transport their produce, carrying them across the bridge to be loaded onto waiting vehicles on the other side. Traders traveling to the capital, Agunankwanta, also face significant challenges having to carry their wares across the damaged bridge before continuing their journey. Auntie Isi is frustrated at government's seeming neglect. This sentiment is shared by many in the community, including a driver who reveals he has been stranded in the area since the bridge caved in, making less than 100 cities in sales per day. Community leader at Abasi, one of the affected communities, says they almost lost a pregnant woman as a result of the situation. I had a complaint from my community that a pregnancy woman was about to deliver. And because of the situation of the bridge, um, the problem was so huge that 
she nearly died. She nearly died. Because uh, by the time the car came here mm. and then uh, they crossed the bridge, there were no car here to take her mm. to the hospital. Okay. So in fact, they waited and then called for a car. By the time the car came, the situation was getting worse. Mm. The chief of Tumentu, an affected community, Nana Ezia Ntua III, is angry at the unresponsiveness of government to this urgent matter. I mean, I call the Kabyan and the Labrija comparison. Mm -hmm. rap, rapid response. Because he may come as an uncle, like many people, he may tourist spot okay, like this forest. He's a capture point forest at a whole way. Prices. Okay, capture point for a lucky one first. He would remember the only forest now West Africa come up projected into the sea. It had come at the tourist area, yeah, the biozone. Mm -hmm. So why? He warns his people will withhold their vote in the upcoming 2024 elections if the bridge is not repaired promptly. From now, Baba. Nesia, Jame, there is no vote. We are not going to vote for them. Not our tongue print. Okay. All right. Yeah, we show them the red card. Okay. Because all your your fault, nail your leg. The grass man move ball. A Jimmy and Annie you. But you you can't grab it. Can be kidding or show. Mazam, I've called my people at two men to me, but then they. Okay. So let them hear. Okay. From my voice, that this is for warning to them. The people here are calling on the government to intervene immediately and restore economic life to the area. It is their hope that the authorities take swift action to address this critical issue and bring relief to the people of Princess Town and its environs. From Ahanta West, for Joy News, I am Samuel Kojobrace. In our next story, management of the Pando Senior High School is worried that the school cannot accommodate the increasing number of students. Headmaster Charles Evans Apreku says the school lacks enough classrooms, accommodation for teachers, dormitories for students, and ICT logistics. Speaking at the local launch of the school's 70th anniversary in Pando, he called for stakeholder collaboration to resolve the infrastructural challenges. The Kpando Senior High School in the Kpando municipality of the Volta region was established in 1953. It now has a student population of 3,498. Due to the rapid increment in student population within the last few years, there's an urgent need to increase infrastructure to accommodate students. The management was compelled to introduce the shift system to make use of the inadequate classrooms, while some classes are conducted in the dining hall. Some students who spoke to Joy News lamented that the development affects the smooth running of academic activities. When we have dining hall section, we have to make it very fast and then make the, um, those having class should come. And then even if class is going on well, and it's time for whole section, class section must be very quick. We have played with the authorities and the head of the state to help us get a new assembly hall for the school because of the population growth of the school. We need a new boys hostel for the school because as, as we go, the population keep rising up. Speaking to the media on the sideline of the local launch of the 70th anniversary of the school, the headmaster, Charles Evans Apriku, asserted that an 18-unit classroom block must be provided to ensure every class has a conducive environment to study. We are running a um, shift, let me say shift. And I hope that if we get another 18 units classroom block, it will help us seize or ease the tension so far as classroom infrastructure is concerned. Uh, we talk of a school vehicle bus to, for excursion for students. Uh, for now, we have not been given the government buses that is being distributed. And I want to use this opportunity to appeal for a bus for the school. Less than half of the 235 teaching and non-teaching staff are housed on the campus due to the unavailability of enough staff bungalows. Another worrying development is the lack of enough computers in the school, though it offers elective information communication technology courses. 
the, our laboratory, ICT, the student population and those who are doing ICT as a core is very large. If we don't get uh, computers, it means that WASI, for example, we have to travel, as an old school of this nature has to travel to another school before you can write. Uh, it's, it's, it's an urgent appeal I'm making to our old students, PTA, and the government to come to our aid. For the 70th anniversary, the Old Students Association has decided to invest into three projects that we refer to as 70th anniversary legacy project. And these projects are the Science Academy of the school, that is the the base for the National Science and Math Quiz, Robotics Center, and the National Cyber Security Center. The guest speaker for the anniversary launch, Nyatepe Kosi Ayibo, entreated teachers, parents, and the community to play their respective roles to ensure an effective education for the students. Fred Kwame Asai, Joy News, Pandu. Let's get into the politics now and campaign team of Alan Tremating is alleging that Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia is using government's institutions to induce and threaten delegates. According to them, despite claims by President Akufuado that he was not supporting any aspirant, their observations pointed to the contrary. Spokesperson for the Alan Tremating team, Bwabinga Samwa cites OT, the OT region, where some district assemblies are reportedly using the District Assembly Common Fund to purchase and distribute weedy size to induce the delegates to support the Vice President. He spoke to Samuel Mbura of our political desk. The establishment is not working. Establishment, which includes the President and, and others, are demonstrating otherwise. I mean, the Finance Minister. Uh, uh, chats and says that he is going to spend all the money he can to make sure that somebody wins. Who is uh, that somebody? That somebody is the establishment candidate. That somebody Who is the establishment is number two. candidate? That somebody is uh, uh, the vice president. I mean, we are all aware that he is the establishment candidate. Because well, the establishment is behind him. And the president says he is not behind him. So it's a signal that I think that the party must pick up. If the president says that he is not behind anybody, then the party delegates must stand up. The party delegates must resist any attempt from. How, how do you want people. them to do this? How do you want the party by, by, or the delegates to do this? By rejecting some of the inducements and the threats. What are the That is Assembly's Common Fund. I see. We no and this is Assembly's Common Fund was sharing uh, weedy sites uh, and fertilizers at this time to people. Why, why would they be doing Were they sharing to delegates? They're sharing to delegates. Those who be taking part in the we super delegates congress. Sharing to delegates. And you have evidence? We, we were there when it happened. We had just we arrived when after immediately after the sharing. So you had delegates with boxes. Uh, some of them carrying it home. Some of it uh, uh, with them right in the room where we were having the meeting. You understand? We we saw it. It, it so, so, it's so obvious. So who, who who are those behind this, or who is behind? The, the sharing of these goodies to them. District Assembly's Common Fund. So who has instructed them to do that? I have no that? idea. I'm not in the meeting where instructions were given or otherwise. Please, this is a broad situation. I'm telling you that the president feels compelled to detach himself from this. Because in public, it's obvious. It's obvious that there's an organized process behind uh, 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 one of the aspirants, who is the vice president. It's very obvious. And if the president has... Uh, felt the need to come out and detach himself from it. I'm saying that it's a good signal. To so, it, to your camp, what does it mean to you? It means that individual delegates must advise themselves. But, spokesperson for the campaign team of the vice president, Samir Uku, has dismissed these allegations, describing them as baseless. I have stated that the Honorable John Peter Kamehu is a minister of the government, in this government. 
and supporting the Honorable Anna Chairman. The Honorable Abna Osea Sari is a Deputy Minister for Finance at the Ministry of Finance, supporting the Honorable Alan Chemat. You've had members of parliament openly supporting the Honorable Alan Chemat. So when you say that uh, um, 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 others supporting Dr. Baumia is wrong, then that means you're only picking and choosing. Now we we'll repeat, if the principle is wrong, then tell me that nobody should support anybody. Let's all become um, quiet men and women in the party and, and only watch the process. We are part of the decision. Well, that he's I vote. I'm a voter, I'm a delegate. A super delegate because I'm a member of the National Council representing the Eastern region. And I'm also a former national organizer. So with these two voting rights, I can only vote once in one category. Either I choose to vote as a former national organizer or I vote as a member representing the Eastern region on the National Council. Well, well his specific accusation is that, or allegation is that, they were in the OT region and the district assembly was using the um, district common fund to purchase spray and fertilizer for delegates. And then he made an allegation that it is in support of your candidature ah, and they feel it is an abuse of the state. Yes. And then we should be serious about this. Because I don't think I have it. Else, else we'll be chasing things in a If you have, uh, if, if you can prove an allegation of wrongdoing, it's a very serious matter. Mind you, the very things that we say to the Ghanaian people and to the public. These are the things that our opponents are going to compound and use against them. Even an internal election, you are telling me that we are using district assembly common fund to purchase fertilizer. I mean, that, 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 is, that is a very low point. Now, staying with the politics, the General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, uh, NDC, Fifi Fiavikwete, has objected to the new Patriotic Party's claim of turning the corner, citing it as a sign of their lack of remorse over their governance failures. He criticized the 2023 media budget's assertion that the ailing economy had been stabilized, describing it as an attempt by the MPP to look good in the midst of the storm. He spoke to my colleague Evans Mensah while leading a party's delegation a curtsy call on the leadership of the Multimedia Group Limited in Accra on Thursday. Uh, we decided as a party to uh, start uh, a series of uh, media visitation. Uh, we actually should have done this right from the very beginning uh, when I became general secretary. But of course, you know, we came in straight with quite a number of activities, administrative things that have really held us up uh, all the way to the election of flag bearer. Uh, soon after that, then we move into the by-elections and also I would say we feel this is a nice moment to, to really do what we should have done right from the beginning. Basically, uh, to just establish a, a relationship, uh, build bridges, uh, define areas where we can uh, work in partnership for the sake of Ghana, not necessarily for the sake of NDC at all, but for the sake of Ghana. We believe we all have the same vision for the country, to see a country that becomes great and strong. And we believe the media plays a key role in making sure that happens. And there are areas where we can improve each other, uh, to become more tolerant, uh, to be able to hone, hone down on issues that we think are very important for the country, generally to create an atmosphere where the media will be allowed to do its job well, and we also in in, uh, in the political space. I also was working on, and I think 15 other constituencies are still outstanding in your uh, parliamentary primaries. So what's the update on that? I would say that uh, we, uh, uh, they are the next ones we are looking at. We actually have actually um, agreed already to do it in two separate uh, uh, phases. We'll be doing what we call the northern, I mean the central zone. In that central zone, we'll have to, we'll have eastern region, Ashanti region, and a half region. Those three, and we're looking at making sure we close those ones by the end of August this month, and then we'll be left with what I call the the, the coastal, or let's call it the southern zone. That will be Greater Accra, Central Region, Western Region, and I think Western North. So that would be done later by the end of September. So effectively, with that, they would have completed all, all the outstanding ones. So we, re, we, are, we are ready to, 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 to roll with the first one, which is the, uh, the, I mean, what you call this, the Central Zone. Let's talk sports now. And Ghana Premier League champions, Midiama have been given a financial boost ahead of their CAF Champions League campaign later this year, courtesy a one million CD gift by President Akufuado. The president who made the pledge to the team when they called on him at the Jubilee House also charged them to make Ghana proud at the Continental Showpiece 
when it begins in September. And I have to begin by first of all congratulating you, the captain and the members of the team for this historic achievement. The 47 years since the cup was last won by a team from the Western region. This is great. You've done a great job. Congratulations. <laughs> Against people who win the league, you have to have some people there. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, but I want to congratulate you very much. And you're getting the congratulations from somebody who's a fanatic of Asante Kosovo. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you know that it's genuine, my congratulations. Well done. And, uh, and, and a, t a, t a team that was born in Duca's hometown, Duncan, that's, that's an excellent thing. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I think that uh, the Deputy Minister of Sports is here to assure you that whatever we can do to help in the continental engagements that you are, you are going to be involved in this year, we'll do our best to assist to make sure that you have a successful tilt. And then I understand that you are in fact being invited to be in Washington in the month of October for the Ghana Week. That you've been invited to go and play Washington DC Football Club. Oh wow, that's going to be a big event. So I wish you the best of, that, of luck for that. But I'm sure that when the time gets near, the government people will also come in and make sure that things go well for you there. But thank you very much for coming. I'm honored by you coming to present this cup to me. And I want to congratulate the playing body once again for this historic achievement. You've done well. The, it's good for the Ghana, Ghana football and for the league that there's diversity in the people who come through. We shouldn't have this. For, for years, it was a duopoly in Ghana, Kotoko Hearts. And then when Adriana broke through a bit, yeah, but uh, it's good. We have yet somebody else now. And we'll all remember the name Mediama Football Club. Mr. Well, that will be it for uh, the news, but do stay with us. Up next, we get into the news review. We'll be right back. Welcome back on the AM show, and I'm joined by a master architect when it comes to politics in this country. He's a wonderful gentleman. I'll be showing his face to you uh, shortly. But the segment, the news review segment on the AM show, is always brought to you by Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. They're offering you, if you're a man watching me this morning, you want to stay virile, you want to achieve your full potential in every way. As a man, but have you checked your prostate? What was the last time you investigated, had a full body scan, and also considered your prostate? Maybe you don't even know what role it plays in your body, but it could get malignant. And when that happens, or if you have any problems there with enlargement and the rest, you could be in a terrible situation. So don't risk it. If you're a woman, maybe you've never checked out your fertility. You just think, oh, I'm a woman. As you produce your eggs and all of that, as they depreciate in quantity over time, you don't know what is happening there. You do not know. Maybe for some things, before they begin to show signs, then it means things have come to a head. So as a woman, do you know your fertility status? Do you know whether you're developing fibroids and the rest? That is why for these and more, you can reach out to Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. And they're saying that if you're a man, you come for prostate screening. It's free, gratis. If you're a woman, you're coming for fertility screening. It is free. Now, here's where you can locate them. Wankwa, wala, wala. Here in Accra at Spintex opposite the Shell signboard. 
Kumasi Kronumagwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There's Takradi Anaji Estate. There's Tema Community 22. There's Techim and Hanswa and the CMI and Zama. Their call lines are 0244 867 068 or 0274 234 321. And Point Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease. But just the start of the news review, and I'm joined by another one of my brothers from another mother. He goes by the name Samuel Mbura. Sam. Ben. Baboom. Morning. How would you say good morning? Um, it's good to be here in your language. <clears throat> you can say bulika. Also. Bulika. 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 Bembe. Bembe. Yeah. What so, does the bembe mean? Bembe means <clears throat> good morning. Bulika means good morning. Okay. Just like the fancy and chi. So okay. you see that someone says something different. I mean, wants to greet in chi in the morning. The same as um, what their accounts will say, but the accent or the dynamics in the language. So that is just basically. So if you go to the Upper East Region, for instance, those who are in Bongo, they say bim bim. Bim bim means good morning. If you go to Bonga, mm. they they speak the Greenia as well, but they will say bulika. Okay. So you go to Talisi, for instance, then they will say biego biego. You, you realize that the the B sound passes through in the in the greeting. So um, that's how my language is. It's dynamic, but I am from Bongo. So I, I will greet Bule, uh, Bimbe. Then Bimbe. you respond, Naba. 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 Yeah. OK. I see. So yeah. let's do this. Yeah. Bulika. Um, would I have to? Yeah, yeah. Or just the Naba? No, just straight, Naba. straight up. Yeah, straight up. OK. Bulika or Bimbe. <coughs> I've, learned, <laughs> I've learned something this morning. Yeah, yeah. At least for those who of you who would say, indeed, the Wezo mm. and the Yamamwache yeah. and all of that, Akwaba, Yenina, mm. uh, um, Would they say Sandazwa? Sandazwa, that, that's how the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sandazwa. Yeah, yeah Sandazwa. I, mean, I, I think that, that's how the. Sanukade. Sanukade. I'm not actually good at how so I'm unable to. <laughs> I speak, I speak a little. I see. You know, the other day um, I was in traffic. Interesting okay. situation. And um, this rider, motor rider, just viciously crossed me at the Afrikiko traffic light. Yeah. You know, heading where you're around and head towards the Jubilee House. Exactly, yeah. And, uh, and I, I lowered the, the screen mm. to, to my side. And, and then he went like, well, what did he even say? He, he, he spoke in Hausa. Yeah, he spoke in Hausa. And then I interjected. Honestly, I was, I was a bit, you know, I interjected. I, I, I went back at him mm. and I asked him, Kachimi. Mm. And I nearly added something. Then, then I could tell the shock on his face. He just looked at me like, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually. Some of the places we've lived and the things we've, we've experienced. Sometimes people see you and they think, oh. Yeah, that's one of the languages yeah. that I would like to learn. I've tried several years, but oh, well, that's not, interesting. Picking, not picking up. I, I don't know. Mm. How's uh, ever and then Ga? These are the three languages that I would want to, to learn more. Okay. Mm. Well, we'll be looking at um, the online portals as today we do not have any newspapers. But I'd like, you know, there's this document that... It's been a while since I looked at it. Today, I want to go back to it and take a look at some of what it says. Okay. Uh, many people are not privy to this, but it is the Ghana at 100 documents. And it's not something that is shared. It's not something that is out there. But some of us, thankfully, have got that document. And I'll be reflecting with you and the rest of Ghanaians on some of what we aspire to and the reality on the ground. Of course, later when I share my bland thoughts, I'll also get into uh, some of those matters. But for you, uh, Samuel Mbura, throughout this week, what have been some of the most topical issues that have come up? Of course, there's the accusation you covered that exactly. look, we decide yeah. district exactly. assemblies come that was, that was actually be yesterday. used on, on uh, yeah. behalf of the vice president to yeah, that, induce. That, yeah, that's the allegation the... coming from the Alan Camp. Yesterday, yeah. uh, you know, the party elections committee called for a meeting with the aspirants, 10 of them. So um, before then, we know that the president met the party communicators 
and made it clear that he was not going to support or he wasn't supporting any aspirant ahead of the uh, August 26th Super Delegates Congress, which aims at trimming down the aspirants that are 10 to 5. Do not go, uh, do not go to the main Congress in November to select the flag bearer for the party. Right. So on the back of that, I, I saw Boabia Asamoa, who is with the campaign team of um, the former trade and industry minister, Alan Shemante, and then I posed that question to him that, what, what do you make of the president's comment? Do you think that it's, it now brings finality to the perception that the establishment is behind one candidate? And he made a point that um, his, the, the president's decision to announce this, is he, to him, it is a compelled one because of the concerns that are coming from the rank and file of the party and from the public and, and all that. So, but he thinks that it came at a time that his establishment is using the state resources to support the establishment candidate, which is uh, the vice president, Dr. Mahmoud uh, Baumia. So he cited an example that they were at the OT region in one of the rounds, and then they noticed that the district assembly common fund was being used to procure uh, weed size and fertilizer to be distributed to farmers. And these were surprisingly delegates of the party. So um, they tried knowing why, what the motivation was behind this particular move by some of the district assemblies. And what they discovered was that it was part of the machination from the establishment within government to support the vice president's um, I mean, campaign. Acting for evidence, he said they went and met the the distribution ongoing, and they, they think that it's not in the right direction. So the Baumia camp also responded, said that this, these are wild allegations. If you think that you have the facts, why don't you go to court or maybe bring it out for, or raise the issues for them to be investigated because the issues are raising, you are raising a, a really critical one. So uh, that's the <laughs> accusation and the response from the Baumia team. And on top, I mean, Newsnight, we spoke to the OT regional chairman, um, Juan Evans Dapa, and then he said that he is not aware of such activities ongoing on in his region, uh, but they have interest in it. They will look into it. But for now, we should disregard them as a, a targeted propaganda from the Alan camp um, against his uh, opponent. But I, before then, I spoke with our OT regional correspondent, mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, Peter Seno, and then he said that they, per his checks, he's unable to authenticate such um, claims and all that. So this, this is the back and forth about the alleged use of um, state funds to procure um, fertilizer and weed sites for delegates mm. in the OT region. Interesting developments there. We've also had some interesting developments on the back of Cecilia Dapa exactly. <clears throat> and everything that is happening, the AG's intervention. And one of the lawyers for the accused saying that his client stole absolutely nothing, nothing yeah. and that the intervention by the attorney general is, uh, you know, a misuse or an abuse of his powers and all of that. I, I want us, right before we get to the online portals, and yeah. we have time, we can, we can get there shortly. I want to run this by you. I don't know whether you've seen the Ghana at 100 document. Mm. And, and this is something that, look, Nanada Danko Kufuado, John Dramani Mahama, yeah. uh, Evans Atta Mills, may so rest in peace, John Ajakum Kufu, Flight Left and Rawlings, uh, all in a way have contributed yeah. uh, to. But this is the plan. And I wanted to read it for all of you, Ghana, for, to, to hearken to this and tell me what you think. It says... Our resilient past and ongoing transformation agenda gives us cause for hope for a better Ghana beyond aid. The participatory democracy and sustained democratic governance in the country present a huge opportunity for a brighter future. And then it talks about the portrait of Ghana at 100. Mind you, this is 2023. In 2057, we'll be 100 years old. But what will Ghana look like at 100? That's the question. So today, as we celebrate Founders Day, I felt we should walk through some of our aspirations, our goals, and find out whether in 2023, how many years away? 2023, mm. 27, yeah, so that'll be 31. Century, yeah. You're looking at the next century. 
No, no, no. no so I mean, when thirty-one is, years. When, when is Ghana? Thirty-one. When is in Ghana? thirty-one years. Okay, thirty-one time. years. Yeah. Is it? Is it thirty-one? Let me. So Ghana simple. at the moment we uh, know that uh, twenty-three. Twenty-seven. That will give you fifty. So yeah, some thirty, thirty-one years time. Yeah. Some thirty, thirty-one years time. This is what we aspire to be. I just want to read it. All right, Samuel, and tell me what you think and whether you think we are even on course. <laughs> By 2057, it is envisioned that Ghana will be a high-income country with the following minimum characteristics. One, self-confident citizens with high standards of patriotism anchored on discipline, good work ethic, who put the welfare of the country above self-interest. Our politicians themselves are not living up to this. Two, nominal GDP. Okay. Interesting. Nominal GDP of approximately $3.4 trillion and per capita GDP of not less than $50,000 equivalent per capita. I see. If you're an individual, you should be able to earn that <laughs> per year. In Ghana here. <laughs> Resilient, service-oriented, industrialized, and globally competitive economy. Basically moving beyond taxation to production, yeah. like we've said. A business and financial hub in the West African sub-region. Modernized agriculture for sufficient food to ensure food security and raw materials for agro-based industries and exports. Minimum income disparities. Robust pension scheme. Affordable and diversified energy supply. Effective, efficient, dynamic and inclusive institutions that ensure accountability, integrity and transparency with negligible levels of corruption. Let me end it here. All right. It goes as far as, I mean, there are so many of them. This particular list ends at 18. But let me end it there. On that score of effective, efficient, dynamic, and inclusive institutions that ensure accountability, integrity, and transparency with negligible levels of corruption. Look at where our GDP is now. Yeah. We have just about three decades to go. 2023. Yeah. We have just about three decades to go. I don't know what you think. Is this realistic, looking at the path we're on? It's possible, but it depends on the mindset. The problem in Ghana is not about leadership. <laughs> That's the view I've always held, that the problem we face now as a country is not about the leaders, but the mindset of the people out there. Because the leaders leading the country are the reflection of the people. Mm. Look, we, we have been talking about elections upon elections. You go to certain constituencies, they know that they are so improvised, they need development, yet they know that the person they are presenting may not be competent, but because of the fact that the person brought goodies or money, resources to come and share to them individually, they prefer such people to people who are, I mean, development-minded, people who have that social connection, social capital. I have always been... Or maybe that, even the intellectual exactly. capital. Exactly. I've always believed that it is not about what you have in your pocket or the resources that you have in terms of the cash as a person, but it depends on the social capital, the number of people that you have around you that can help you. We have MPs who are in opposition. However, they are able to develop their communities. The fact is that it is not that they are relying on government subventions to be able to do that, but because of the connections they have built, it's because of their social capital. Okay. One day I become an MP for Bongo. This is just an example. I know Benjamin. Benjamin has his expertise. Hopefully, he, it, it is an example that <laughs> it's an example. It's, it's, no, no, it's an example. I'm just making. Mm. So I know Benjamin. I place a call to Benjamin. Ben, I, I want you to help my constituency with this. You are able to mobilize resources. Maybe you also have other contacts that will say, I have a very good friend who is very good. We want to help him out with this. Then they come in. But if you look at the our, the decisions that we take at the citizenry level, it goes on to hunt us for years because of the simple mistakes that we make. So for us to achieve some of these things that they, the, the, the objectives that have been captured in this 100-year developmental plan or whatsoever, we have to start changing our mind. We cannot put the people that we have given the power to out of our own actions, then tend to blame them. If you think that they are not right, elections are there, take them out, bring in the right people. We will complain but, 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 on but several we, occasions we, that been able things, to do that. That's the problem. The, the right caliber of people to steer the affairs of the country. After Nkrumah, it's been, we've been in a shambles, yeah. basically. And we've had 
we had Agenda 2020. And now some people, Osafo Mafu and the rest, were telling us, you can't even plan beyond 10 years. You shouldn't plan for 40 years. But even the Chinese are doing it. Yeah. They have done that consistently. Even they who are where they are, yeah. they are doing it. Mm. It's because, of the it, mindset, it's, it's, it's because of the mindset revolution. You're just making an example of um, how this motor rider rode carelessly before mm. by you. In other countries, the advanced countries, they, you don't need a policeman to stand and direct you that this is traffic, slow down. This is a zebra crossing, you have to slow down. Uh, go at a speed of 30 kilometers per hour on this stretch of the road. So the people from the onset have been conscientized. So if they become leaders, it reflects. I was told a story about how if you go to some of the Francophone countries, friend was telling me about Burkina Faso. Oh, yeah. How they take measurements. Yeah. Everything that they do is accurate. They make sure that, okay, if I'm going to build a house, I need like 10 bags of cement. They measure it accurately in that regard. The Bible will say, say that it's, it's only a fool who starts building without having calculated. E exactly. And, and made, you know, an assessment of how much it will cost and all of that, because in the end, then people will laugh at you and exactly. say, oh, he started something and couldn't finish. So you do certain things at first, actually. You look at the universities, for instance, where the student politics mostly begins and transcends into mainstream elections. Look at the number of reported cases of corruption, even with management at the level of student politics or SRC management. You have such people coming into mainstream politics. They eventually come to lead the country, take decisions for us and all that. So. If we don't start from the bottom, start conscientizing and then telling the younger generation that, look, the destiny of the country is in your own hands. It depends right. on your mindset. Let's embark on a mindset, uh, mindset revolution right. for us to be able to achieve it. If not, this one will continue to be the grammar that our children, our great-grandchildren will come and be reviewing every year that this was a document that was, I mean, uh, put together about 100 years ago or 30 years ago they will still struggle. If and you don't change your mindset, corruption, bad governance will continue to fester in the system. And we have 34 years, to be yeah. specific. I mean, off the top of my head, uh, it was, we have 34 years to go. And I just did the calculation on this. You see, when we talk about the fact that by 2057, yeah. we want to have a nominal GDP of $3.4 trillion. <clears throat> That is the GDP now of some advanced countries exactly. in the world, okay? You want a nominal GDP of 3.4 trillion. The last time I checked, I could be wrong, mm -hmm. our current GDP hovers around 70-something billion yeah. dollars, hmm. okay? What that means, if you do the division, is that our current GDP is around 2.9%, less than 3% yeah. of what we are projecting. Exactly. That in some 34 years' time, we will be doing. This is a drop in the bucket. Exactly. Less than 3%. When will Yet we in there? 30 years or 34 years, you think you can wave some magic wand and all of a sudden you have an economy. And mind you, other economies are also speeding up. <laughs> By that time, where will those economies be? Yeah. Are we on any trajectory towards, you know, achieving some of these goals. We talk about strong institutions. Obama yeah. came and said, yeah. we don't need strong men, we need strong, strong institutions. institutions. The institutions, institutions yeah. are not working. Exactly. Because and even the roles are conflicted. Our executive just look at so the, top heavy. Just look at the case of the Everything Cecilia, is. Look at the case of Cecilia Dapa. Yeah. Okay, we have the, yeah. the police on one side, the attorney general now taking charge of the criminal prosecution. Almost appearing to take sides. Fine. So uh, OSP is also doing this work. Is Shrive supposed to go or someone is supposed to petition? Is there a role Iyoko can play? So you see that the, the roles are somehow intertwined. So you don't have a clear cut point that this. The, Something the, comes. The, should we let Shrive do it? Do it. Should, or this should the special prosecutor take it out? Why is the AG. I mean, and, and, and that goes back to yeah. some of what was raised the concerns about setting up this whole office of the special prosecutor and the duplication or replication of roles. Of roles. Yeah. And it only goes to make systems worse, worse. off. That's, that's it. That's it. Worse off. But anyway, uh, th those were just some reflections I wanted to share with you, uh, Ghana, for just to get us thinking on a day like this. 3.4 trillion. Look at where we are. It's not about the big talk. As for a big talk, dear, everyone can talk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How to get to the end. Yeah, beyond the is, mere talk. Is, mm. uh, you know, you've given me an idea. Ghana, beyond the talk. Yeah. I'll note that down. Maybe that will be a theme for Blunt's thoughts. Exactly, for next some, week. So, so, some. But let's get into myjoyonline.com. Uh, Let's start from uh, there.
NDC lashes out at Ekufuado's administration over claims it has stabilized the economy. Parliament orders finance minister to present DDEP for consideration. Maybe let's look at that story about the NDC lashing out at Ekufuado's administration over those claims. Uh, Sam, would, yeah. it, would you like to take that story? Right. So, you know, the uh, leadership of the NDC um, came to multimedia here as part of their familiarization visit. And that's where this uh, comment was made. Uh, that's the general secretary of the party, uh, Fifi Kwiti there. So uh, they think that the, the economy, and let me just quote him, he said, the kind of collapse we have seen in terms of the economy is one that requires a certain amount of humility to rush quickly and want to start beating your chest and applauding. It indicates that somehow they have not learned as quickly as they should. So the concern here has to do with the government touting itself in the achievements in the financial sector. They talk about... The finance the minister says we, we've turned the corner. <laughs> and honestly, the corner. honestly, I don't know which corner we've turned. Yeah. I don't know. Mm. If, if, if you say we are gradually turning, turning the corner, yeah. it makes sense. But to say we've turned the corner, mm. I mean, suggests we're out of the woods. And... Mm. and you don't have to be an economist or a finance person to know that. So if this corner if is, is if you are turning being... the corner, how, how, what is our, our, our debt now as a country? Mm. We are hoping around six hundred billion. In fact, recently right? on the back of what has happened with exactly. the central bank, we've yeah. added over twenty percent to exactly. our debt stock. So we are running We're approaching six hundred billion, billion yeah. Ghana cities. So if you are really turning around the corner or turning the corner <laughs> in the economy, why are we still having all these challenges? We know that the they do attribute to the, the, what they call it, the war in Ukraine and Russia. They're talking about COVID still having an impact mm. on the economy. But it's a whole lot. Look at the, the, the lack of frugality in the system, how we spend money, the reports coming in. I don't know where you've read fully the Auditor General's report. You've read what the BOG has captured in this audited report, losing over 60 billion. They are attributing it to the government DDEP program ahead of the IMF bailouts and all that. And I'm not sure our woes will end here. It will continue. It but at will, least... Because at, we are getting at, to at, another election here. Yeah, and, and, and that is the, the problem because we know about indiscipline, yeah. recklessness when it comes to... Financial recklessness when it comes to uh, electoral years. Even the years preceding, yeah. we're already seeing that. Some candidates from the ruling party going around and how money... Is sprayed Slash buses around, yeah. and you know all of that, and sometimes the very silly uh, rationalization that is given to it, almost as though oh, you people can't think. Yeah, we can tell you anything, and you 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 swallow it. But at least, at least, this government has been able to do something. Yeah, because you know the IMF money, you must meet certain requirements, milestones, and Before. on some different fronts. They've been able to meet those requirements, guaranteeing that by close of year, we'll get the second tranche of what's $300 million from the IMF, making $900 million we would have secured from the IMF. But then again, even as you, you look at that positive, then you look at the negative of the fact that you see what the Auditor General recently put out, yeah. over $15 billion. Exactly. Losses, wastage. The good thing there, over 99 I think 99.6% yeah, can be recovered. is recoverable. Yeah, you can recover it. The question, Samuel Umbura, mm. will it be recovered? That's the question. Do you remember there was a time when even the finance ministry, mm. there were ghost names, people drawing 21,000. On in salaries. Uh, people take scholarship, go to study happen? in the US or South Africa, they don't come back, they are still paid two years and all that. Yesterday, we spoke to Professor Samuel Entry, he's the dean of uh, students at the UPSA school and uh, university. And then he is also an auditing expert on the SMS. And his point was that, look, this um, annual ritual of publishing the Auditor General's report without uh, punishing those culpable is, is what is giving them the motivation to continue. Look, you have the uh, principal uh, spending officers mm. who don't do due diligence and cause these financial losses to their institutions. Why are you not going after them? So charge them. Let them pay. Next time, it will serve as a deterrent to others. Not to do that. Do you remember the Kroll and Associates story? <laughs> do you remember? Yeah, I do. I do. Oh. So it's quite interesting that every, every year we talk about the leakages in the system, yet pragmatic measures are not thickened. It's like fetching water with a basket. <laughs> basket. <laughs> quite interesting it, there. And, and, and that also brings me to mm. the lack of will. Yeah. I will say it here. The president lacks the will. The vice president lacks the will. The ministers lack the will. 
our parliamentarians lack the will to do what is required. Look, you can tell me whatever you like. But no, no, hold on, hold on. No, but I just want to chip this in. But can, as, as citizens, are we playing that watchdog role aside what the media it, is doing? Exactly. Are we getting the backing from the, the, the citizens to push them to do the right because thing? Because some citizens, a few people, are benefiting from the system. And those people will push everything to ensure the system remains the same. Because when it does, who are the beneficiaries? Exactly. They are. So it brings me to that next story that we can see. Ghana Integrity Initiative, GACC, call for urgent passage of conduct of public officers' bill. Look, <laughs> Cecilia Abnadapa, no yeah. one will hang her. Oh, no. She has, in this dispensation, in this jurisdiction, you are innocent until proven, proven guilty. Guilty. Yeah. Yeah, my answer, so we accept. But all these Anansi stories about... Ownership and Sawa, <laughs> uh, funeral, and they gave money. Yeah. And maybe it belongs to her husband. He's been an architect for fine. Yeah. I, I don't have a problem with that. Oh, it belongs to her brother. The point is, funding should have a source. Yeah. The source should be what? No. Be able to be proven, right? Yeah. You come to equity, come with clean hands. Okay. Where is your evidence? So, give us the evidence. And that is where the conduct of public officers bill comes in exactly. because it will address some of these matters you are a politically exposed person yeah. wait you've put up this building okay this How building per eye assessment is worth let's say Millions 750,000 Ghana cities yeah. your salary is x official salary we do not know any other means of sustenance of yours can you madam can you sir prove how you got this We've seen politicians acquire buildings in the AU village. Do you know what it takes to get a building in AU village? Do you know how much they go for? Very expensive. With swimming pools and all of that. People who, before politics, had not done any work. On both sides, we have seen young people that back yeah. then we were practically in university with, did no work, NDC, NPP. They came to power and all of a sudden, I mean, they have tons of cash to spend. So that is what... And, and you ask yourself... How is it possible? Mm. So we are working, we are not seeing that so, kind of so money. How did what get do you do? So your annual salary, how much is it? Your allowances that you take during your committee meetings, how much is it? Do you have other Let's side business? Let's add all of them together. Let's, Let's even them. add your ex so, so how, how? How did you get this? But we lack the will as citizens, not only the government or the institutions responsible, but as citizens to question them because we are always expectant of them to bring us goodies. When MPs go home, I know a couple of friends and brothers who hardly go home because they tell you that, look, every visit that I make, I spend no less than 100,000 cities. So let's say in a month, I visit my constituency thrice or even twice. 300K. 300K. Because the demands are so overwhelming. But, 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 you, but let, no, let, let me tell you this. It will shock you that some people even go to their MPs to ask them to support them to dowry their wives. Yeah. Yes, they asked money for oh, the other day when, when the dropper what? MP yeah. or was it or was it some other MP? The person was asking for. He says he's starting a ride hailing business, Uber, yeah. and he wants a phone. Yeah. I've had some of them tell me here that look, people reach out to them. Oh, me see me dying. Foundation. I need. I need money for the foundation. So I all these all, all these sorts precious, of ludicrous pressures on them will push them to do what they can do to survive. But, 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 also, but the other the other side of the coin yeah. is. Because our leaders, look, mm. in political science back then, undergrad studies, they would tell you people elect these parties to come into power to deliver the bacon, so to speak, yeah. to deliver certain things, the booms. Now, when people see that you are not delivering that, yeah. they find alternative means of getting what they feel belongs to them. Yeah. So then, especially in this very political system we've created, mm. where members of parliament are not agents of development, but we forced them into that position... Yeah. When they see you, they think you have sacks of money mm. over there. Yeah. So when we see you, we voted for you. Honorable Charlie, it is time to sort us out. Sort us out. That is the convoluted situation we've created in Ghana. Because we are not giving the people, because if you give the people what they need, yeah. the good roads, the hospitals, the, the, a proper economy that can absorb, Some of them will not enhance see their that. economic they will not rights. See that. Yeah. Masa, if, if you are earning a very, very, very good salary yeah. and you are all of that, would you go begging anybody 
or, or accept inducement and stuff like that's that. That's the challenge. So the beyond the political class, we also have the other people who are not politically exposed. They, are, they say they are technocrats, but their livelihood, you go to their um, hometown, the money that they are making, how are you able to do that? Mostly the politician is on the spotlight for accusation, for slattering, uh, when it comes to public funds and all that. But we have technocrats who are equally having questionable what, I mean, uh, assets. How did you acquire it? You work as a di director for a particular ministry or a particular institution. How were you able to gather this amount of money to afford you the luxury that you have? To the extent that it will be able to fund you to go into active partisan politics. So this is, it's, it's more than less a multifaceted issue that we need to approach. One, from the political class. Two, um, the citizens and then the technocrats as well. And I think that with this particular view, it will help us to an extent, if only the, that will and commitment is there, to enforce it to the latter. Mm. Yeah. And uh, we only pray. Uh, some of you are asking me to share the Ghana at 100 document. I do not have that permission yet uh, because of where we sourced that information from. But we'll be sharing bits and pieces of that. I just had to acknowledge so I let you know. Uh, ordinarily, I would have shared with you, but it's not information I can just put out there for now. Uh, hopefully, when it becomes that accessible, then I can do that. Uh, the, the title of my blunt thoughts today, and I've told you, if you've missed any of my blunt thoughts today, you don't want to miss this one. Trust me. <laughs> I've titled it, A Forced Haircut, A New Pipe Dream, and pipe dream there, I'm talking about affordable housing and pukwasi, and a cycle of wastage, Ghana on the ropes. Are you... Are really? you that's quite interesting. Uh, uh, it, you know, I'll take you all the way back to Nkrumah and some of the things we've never contemplated yeah. and some of the things in housing that he yeah. did that has not been mentioned. Mm. I think last two weeks, I was on my way to uh, Ada. Mm. You know, there's a housing project just on uh, after. I don't, I'm not much familiar with it. We have to go, though, but yeah, yeah. quickly on that. Yeah, but it's, I, mean, I saw the houses. I, I was told that it's part of the housing projects. And... They have been, they've not been occupied for a couple of years. So we'll spend money, build these houses, later strike that one out, come get more money, go to start new projects. It's <laughs> the nonsensical it's leadership it's or misleadership in Ghana. Yeah. And right before we go, happy 84th birthday to Mr. Daniel Ajay of Daniad's Insurance uh, Brokers. Wishing you God's blessings, strength, and vitality. Uh, Kingsley O2. Uh, sent in that one. Happy 84th birthday to Mr. Daniel Ajay of Daniad's Insurance uh, Brokers. But the segment was brought to you uh, by Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. They're offering free prostate screening if you're a man, free fertility screening if you're a woman. Reach out to them at any of their branches uh, across Pentex office of the Shell Signboard, Kumasi Kronoma Abwehi, and behind the Angel Educational Complex, Takrade Anaji State Tema Community 22, the Chiman Hansu and the Siam The call lines 0274. 0244-867-061 or 0274-234-321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. You have a request? I yeah, yeah, I wanted to find out from your motivation for today. You know, last week you shared a message. Some people were motivated. So today, what's your message? Um, let's, let's, let's maintain hope. It's something I actually put at the tail end of my... You know, you can lose everything, but when you lose hope... Yeah. You know, so my... Let's, Regardless of the situation, times are hard, exactly. times are difficult, the times are barren, economically speaking. I went somewhere yesterday, the sort of things I heard nearly broke me. But yeah. let's, let's keep hope alive. That's but it. but, but I have only a moment of this of thought that, look, the greatness that you are witnessing today, don't think that that's all. More is still on your way. The challenges that you are facing, don't think that the challenges will end. Mm. There's a bigger challenge ahead. Prepare your mind, prepare yourself ahead of it so that you'll not be shocked by any eventuality. And that's my message. But today is the birthday of our brother, uh, the, our brother um, Echo Sam. You know, today is a mother's birthday. Yeah. Uh, you know, Echo has been a very good brother, uh, like yourself, since I came to multimedia. And <laughs> I must say happy birthday to uh, his mother, and mother Margaret, Ama Sam. You are such a wonderful mother. We thank you for giving us such a troublesome brother. Yeah. God bless you. <laughs> and speaking of trouble, trouble is like his middle name. <laughs> anyway, that's the note on which we wrap the news review. Up next, we serve you Prime Take with Muftar Nabila Abdullah. It's another part, the second part, if you like, of his interaction with Dolati. Do stay. Give us a brief history of Ghana football.
Well, Ghana football started uh, quite, quite, quite a long time ago. Uh, it was one Britain. He was headmaster of uh, government school in Cape Coast. Uh -huh. He started the thing and he recruited a few local boys and they were practicing under uh, moonlight and so on. And bit by bit, it, it developed until a crack uh, has of work came in. Then there was Stanfast. Stanfast died. For a very long time, we had Hats of Oak and Stanfast. But Stanfast is gone. Stanfast is now Olympics. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and it went on like that. that we, we had problems with coaching. So when Ohinijam became the sports director, as I told you, Kwame Nkrumah was interested in sports. And he knew uh, Ohinijan was interested in sport and was doing it. He and he was around uh, Richard Akwe and so. Oh, okay. You know, in Sawam. He was doing football from in Sawam. And he was, he was there. So when, uh, when Richard Akwe gave way, there was this one. Then we had problems with coaching. So, director of sports. So, Richard Akwe gave way to Ohenijan. Ohenijan, let me say, uh, Richard Akwe's period passed off. And then a new period with Ohenijan in it, Adakwa in Cape Coast, uh, in, uh, uh, in Sawam. No, Adakwa was in Ashanti. Oh, okay. And then they, they, they picked up the, the, uh, the loose ends and started developing it. And Ohenijan uh, did a lot. So he was more or less acting at the instructions of uh, uh, Kruma. You know, they brought in the uh, Real Madrid. And Kruma personally organized that part of our history in football and brought the Real Madrid to Ghana. They played against the Black Stars. It ended up in a 3 3 draw, you see. And, and it went on then, uh, uh, Ohenijan developed, I, we were told at the instruction of Kwame Nkrumah, he developed the Republicans. Real Madrid yeah, came, yeah. then we had the Republicans. Real Republicans. And the Republicans brought a lot of problems. You know, people, they were picking the best from each of the league clubs, and people didn't like it. And it was believed. Whether right or not, whether true or not, I can't tell. It was believed that because of the, 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 the bad blood that this Republicans thing created, ended up with uh, uh, this outside right player, Babayara, getting involved in a, in a road accident, accident, which ended up in his death. Yes. You know, so it was, it was interesting. And Ohinijan did well to develop football. Coaches came from outside, from Germany, from uh, Brazil, Italy, Hungary. from Brazil, all over. You know, and they helped in the training of people. Ohinijan at a stage wanted to develop other sports around football. Oh, okay. He did it. He launched it. But it didn't last. And it faded off. So we've had quite an interesting talk to a lot of it will go into my memoirs. Okay. So yeah. but, but let's let's talk about um the when Real Madrid came to Ghana, did you were you the commentator for that? Yes, game? I was uh, who else? <laughs> I was with my boss. Uh, uh what's his name? Festus. Festus Adai. The the the, the, the match took place at the stadium. On on uh, I think Saturday or Sunday. Yeah. You know, hey, and 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 you should have been there to see. <laughs> I was. You I was you no read, way. I you, was nowhere near being born. You will read it in my memo. <laughs> I was yeah. nowhere near yeah. being born. You were nowhere, nowhere. Yeah, but but people spoke about Ghana football then and Ghana football today. What were the things that? the 60s did right to get Ghana to win the African Cup of Nations, 63, 65, 78, 82. What, what? All that was under uh, Ohenijan 
Oh, Honey Jones, uh, you know, planning. He was a bit dictatorial, so people like him much. You know, sometimes dictatorship can, can achieve things, you know. And, and uh, the players who were featuring, eh, C.K. Jamfi, I don't hear his name anywhere now. It's very painful. C.K. Jamfi, he, he was a wonderful footballer. Uh, he, he did very well, he was a coach, went to train uh, abroad, back in Ghana, went to train back in Ghana. Boom. You don't know about C.K. Jamfi? Oh, I've heard a lot about him. Yes. I even have a copy of his C.K. Jamfi and others. You know, Kwabi uh, Adakwa, uh, outside right for Kotoko, uh, Mfum, you know, yeah, Mfum is Mfum. still alive. Uh, I Dogomoro. hear Dogomoro. Unfortunately, he passed on some few days ago. Oh, Dogomoro. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. And then Agrifin, the likes of Agrifin. Agrifin passed off. Oh, he left his, his planet too early. You know, he and uh, 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 the number 10 chap. Uh, uh, Oh, no, no, he's a tall, big fellow. You know, these two, they have passed off. Whenever they were playing, and 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 Agrifin was in a good position, he would signal uh, the, the, to uh, the, the name will come. He would stand up, signal the number 10, and say, Daye, in, in Fanti. Yeah. Means position yourself well. The pass will go to him, and off it goes. And he had very strong, in number 10, he had very strong uh, foot. His shots were terrible to see, you know, and uh, they were going on like that. Daye, Kwabla or something, I think it was called Kwabla. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but you, you spoke about how most of the things Ohenejan did were under the instruction of Kwame Nkrumah. Yeah, that's right. On, this, this appears to suggest that government had a deliberate plan on what they wanted to do with football. Yes, of course. Their deliberate plan at that time, at, during the time of Kwame Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah saw the virtue in combining sports with unity. And so he, he was using sports as, uh, as, as an instrument to achieve political ends. The, 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 the Union of, of Africa. Oh, okay. So most of the time when we traveled with the Black Star from here to play football, we had a contingent leadership in the group. And when we got to our destination, they held meetings and so on behind uh, cl uh, closed Close doors, doors, which we didn't know about. You know? So it, it, it worked that way. But it worked that way and also brought results to on the pitch. Yes, it did. You know, and since we had we had the four successive Afghan titles. We've not been able to do it in the game. We are still struggling. Yeah, we're still struggling to to at least add to the four <laughs> the four victories. Is, is it about time I'll I'll come back to a different story, but is it about time that government considers a deliberate plan? on how they want to run football in their country? Mm, you see, in football, we have amateur football, amateur. Amateur football yeah. is playing football for the love of it. Yeah. And then we have professional football, which is a career. Uh, the two, it's not, FIFA doesn't smile much on amateur football. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't want, if I say it doesn't, doesn't want much on professional because FIFA will always go in. FIFA is against the interference of governments yeah. in uh, football affairs. The governments manage somehow because some governments fund football development. You know, they, they but FIFA also encourages partnerships between member associations and government because government will always provide the infrastructure for the Yeah, but the, 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 that relationship is, is, for, is difficult to understand because they, they don't like it, but they don't like the uh, governments to interfere. With, and, and some of the associations report government activities to, to FIFA. Uh, I mean, to, yeah, to FIFA. To FIFA. Yeah, but, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I think. One thing that we need to get clear, however, is that 
what FIFA do not want is for politicians or government to dictate yeah, to who leads the management of football yeah. when it comes to the whole idea or, of, 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 or yes, of, of, but FIFA would always encourage that government should provide the infrastructure, government should invest in the national teams and if many years ago we had a deliberate support from Kwame Nkrumah always instructing um, uh, Ohenijan for things to be done and that brought success. Uh, it, this kind of relationship wouldn't hurt. That is why I said the relationship between FIFA and government yeah. is very difficult to draw, the to, line. Yeah, to draw the line. Very difficult. Because one time they are against it, one time they are for it. it and and, and it, it somehow it's working. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about Kotoko. Kotoko, hey. Are you a Kotoko fan? Mm, not exactly. As a book fan? Uh, not exactly. As a commentator, <laughs> I try not to get attached to any club. Because if you do that, in your commentary, it shows. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. You, however ha much you try not to, you are a human being. Yeah. You know, it comes out. So I try to do a kind of... Uh, uh, it, it. Draw, we call we draw your emotions. That's right. Uh, you know, I try not to not to get too involved. But if you ask me, Kotoko, I like them because of their bravery, uh, their winning sprees, and uh, you know, they, they they are there, whether you like it or not, they are there. But but okay. So let me ask this question. Well. House of work is in Accra. But House of work in Accra, and I'm in Accra. You are in Accra. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's understandable. Yeah. Kotoko is in Kumasi. You know what? In the past, people regarded House of work as a club that was supported by fishermen. You know, so they thought it was it was supported by illiterate people. That was it. that was what I learned when when I came on the scene. You know, but I think that idea is yeah. it, it has it has warded off. Yeah. And and it's a different thing now. Uh, what what about Kotoko? You've just given us a brief history of House of Folk, whatever the perception that it was supported by fishermen. What was the brief history of Kotoko? Kotoko is is, is a kind is is a tribal uh, club for Ashantis. That's what that's what people think. And to some you know the Ashanti he quite recently yeah. showing and there has always been Asante here interested in Kotoko. You know, they, they show it. It's a kind of representing the soul of Ashanti on the sporting scene. Okay, so if Hazafog is in Accra, Kotoko is in Kumasi, mm -hmm. how come these two clubs are rivals? What happened? Well, it's because of their performance, their performance, their achievements on the pitch. So they compete. They, the, the rivalry between them is intense, and any time they meet, it's a tug of war. Any time they meet, tug of war, and they, they manage to. They, yeah, remember, we had uh, trouble in that in the Crossport Stadium, so yeah. that, all sorts of things. I remember that uh, when I was doing commentary, any time I did a match involving Asante Kotoko and has to book. Whenever I, when I came back to base, the, the, the officials in the, in the house had marked out my, the, where I was wrong, where I did this, where, oh, okay. and then they called me and they said, when you were saying you, you showed too much of this, you did too much of that, and so on. And it was part of a training that I had as a commentator. So gradually, it, it shaped me. And finally, I became a kind of disinterested, uh, you know, commentator in in the clubs of the of the match. What is your memory game that you've commentated on, um, be it House of Oak uh, domestically or in the continental level, or Kotoko domestically or in the continental level? I think I'll 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 select or pick the match between Asante Kotoko and Engelbert. 
that was played in Kinshasa. Yeah. Uh, and this was in the seventies. Yes, in the seventies. It was. It was a match. That really was a match. And uh, I, I find it difficult to forget it. You know. Then uh, Mobutu Sese Seko was the uh, leader of uh, 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 Congo and he displayed his wholehearted support for Engelbert coming to the stadium in a motorcade or with a motorcade of about 80 uh, you know, riders. Wow. No joke. No joke at all. And then when they lost, he left in, in disappointment. I'll give you the details in my memoirs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I understand that, but in that game, what, what really happened? What? what really happened in that game that you've chosen that one? Yeah, because you know the 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 way in which Engelbert supporters behaved, what they did to support Engelbert, and the way we from Ghana very cleverly squeezed ourselves out of that in any, any trouble, any serious trouble, is something that is weighs on my mind. Was, yeah. was, was, it a, was it a game? Because if we, had, if we hadn't been careful, it could have resulted in, in, in something very, very bad, very bloody. The way Engelbert supporters worked on, they worked, they worked on the feelings of their people. I went, this will be in my memoir, when I went to collect the team's sheet, what happened to me? It remains a secret till now. You read my memo, you'll get it. Yeah, I was also going to tell you got lost at some point. <laughs> got lost. <laughs> no joke. No joke at all. So, no what, joke. Happened? so, what, so what happened? So what happened? I mean, I, I, I was given a treatment that I didn't, deserve, I, I didn't deserve at all. They didn't want to give you the team sheet? They gave me the, the team sheet, but before they did, something happened. Did they beat you? They, they didn't beat me. <laughs> they didn't beat me, but they did something to me. They did something to me. Read my memoir. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would definitely have to read, read this, this memo. But what about the Black Stars? Uh, the what Black about the Black Stars? Like a game, a game that you commentated that you felt that, yeah, this Black Stars was this Black Stars game. Uh, there are so many, so many. Black, Black Star, Black Star, Real Madrid. Yes, that was a match that, that made history. It ended 3-3. Uh, yeah, and it, the black star was then rising. You know, uh, Ohinijan did something which is interesting. He said, any time we talked about the black star, we should not say the black stars. We should not make it plural. We should say the black star. Represent the black star representing a club, I mean, a national team. Black so star. So it is the black star, not yeah, the black not stars. The black stars, yeah. But, but uh, people don't care. Oh, they so always, we've diluted it? Oh yeah, it's always the black stars. It should have been, or it should be the black star. The black star, you know. And the black star, they've done very well. Except that now, I think the, the, the team needs a kind of uh, reorganization. Uh, um, it, 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 should, it, should, it should be, if you, when you have a car, eh, yeah. you drive around for a period, you go to the fitter to change the oil eh, and look, to check your plugs and so on. That's the kind of thing we should do to the Black Star. We should, we should revise, revive it and then bring it up again. Because I think there are a few problems in the, in the camp which we may, not, we may not know of, and I don't know, because uh, I'll find out a lot, which I'll put into my memory, my memoirs about the Black Stars. Okay, so there was a point that um, um, 
Or in fact, let me ask this. Let me ask a question this way: Were there a point you were considered to be the leader of of the Ghana Football Association? Me? Yes. Were there a point like never. that? Never, never. There never was a point. If there was, I didn't know about it. But never, never. But if it had come to your attention, would you have done it? Ninety-six. If they had, if it had come to your attention, like if you were when I was younger, yes, maybe, maybe I would have considered it because it's an honor to be to be in charge of a black star. It's a big honor, and if they had proposed to me, if they had, well, I was involved in intercontinental relationships a lot. You know, there was one uh, Egyptian who was in charge of organizing was uh, administrative side of Africa Union. Okay. And I traveled with him a number of times on some of his things, you know. I, and I, I, maybe he was slowly, not intentionally, unknown to himself. He was, he was getting me to be interested in the Africa Union thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe with that in mind, I would have picked up anything connected with the black stars, connected with African unity. There are people who, who also talk about the 1966 World Cup that Ohinijan said Ghana shouldn't go. Oh, go okay. 66. Oh, is it the role of Africa? Sir? Oh, when 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 we went to Senegal, it was played in Senegal. No, at the, the World Cup. You know, the World Cup was oh, held oh. in England okay. in 1966. 66. Yes, where Ohinijan, because they had said that uh, Africa was supposed to compete with uh, the likes of the Caribbean or it was in the Oceanic World War, mm -hmm. so that they were going to get one rep. And uh, Ohinijan wrote a letter to FIFA telling them that, no, Africa was not going to participate in the competition. Yeah, because of the number of places given to Africa. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and I think that is okay now. We, we, Africa has quite a number of, yeah. a number of uh, places. The next, the next World Cup will be like nine, nine countries. That's right. Uh, let's see what happens. I wasn't keen on that aspect yet. Oh, okay. But, uh, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Okay. So I think Africa is sitting fairly pretty now in affairs of FIFA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when. Pele, World Pele, said that there was an African country, Ghana, which could one day be a winner of the World Cup because he had been here. He had seen the quality Ghanaian players had and all that. But since then, football appeared to have uh, uh, taken the well, nose dive. Uh, the nose diving, you see, unfortunately, we in Ghana are doing something that we should watch. We're injecting too much of politics into everything we do, into education, into medicine, into in everything, politics, politics, politics. And not only politics, but party politics is a, div a divisive uh, elements. It's a dividing thing. Party politics. It, it creates bitterness, it creates uh, separation, and it blinds efficiency. So I think we should watch it. If we can eschew politics in, in almost everything we do, this country will be able to travel very fast. In this case, we, our football? Well, in football, yes. Football as well, football education. Look at poli party politics in the schools. One time, uh, NPP in power, they, they, they extend the uh, secondary school to three years, uh, to four years, and it's forwards and backwards. You know, uh, it, it's, it's not it's not a factor that we should allow to grow. We should stop it. You see, many people now in Ghana. They go into politics not to serve this country, but to make money to, to, for their well-being. And it shouldn't be that way. I don't see it that way. We should not go into politics just to, to, to make money or to be okay. Let's go into politics because we are serving our rural areas. Look at the rural area. I listen a lot because these days I spend a lot of time in the house. 
And what do you hear from a rural area? Water, roads, sanitation, repeated every day. <laughs> and not much is being done about it. Yeah, um, let's, let's sign out the conversation pretty quick. Um, yeah. I was made to understand that there was a point you had to run to Nigeria. What happened? <laughs> And when I left, I left GBC in 1973 out of frustration. Frustration. I left GBC. And I went to Food Distribution Corporation as, as a, a public relations manager. And from food distribution, I went into politics. I was part of the outfit, the, the Ghanaian outfit that. Uh, stood against union government. Union government promoted by General Achampo. Oh, okay. That's right. There was a referendum, whether Ghanaians liked it or not, and Ghanaians kicked against it. After that event, after the loss to Achampo, they started arresting those of us who were in the lead of the opposing group. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I was to have been picked on a Saturday, a late Saturday morning. But God being so good, I got the win of it. And I left the country on a Tuesday, the following Tuesday, and went to Nigeria. And already I had very good uh, connections in Nigeria. Yeah. So I reported to my good friend, Ishola Folonjo. He's, he was the leading commentator at the time. Oh, okay. And at the time I went, he was, he was a... Uh, in charge of radio broadcasting, sound broadcast. So I reported to him, and you know what he said? He said, Joe, are you saying that Ghana doesn't want you? I said, yes. He said, look, there's a program going on downstairs at the music studio. Go and join them. That's how I started working with the uh, Nigerian broadcasting. Oh, okay. And they treated me very well. I should say this and say it again. They treated me very well. They have a big uh, training school. I was given a chance to lecture at the training school, you know, which I thought was, was a very big honor. And when, the, the, when Buhari, who recently retired, yeah. eh, when Buhari was a military, gov a military head of state in Nigeria, he had a second, a number two man called uh, Idi Agbon. Idi Agbon was known for his discipline. He was a disciplinarian. So he introduced, uh, he introduced uh, a project called War Against Indiscipline. Why? W-A-I. Why? Okay. And the day it was to be launched, I was asked to go and do the commentary at the National Theatre. Oh, I see. And, yeah. And everybody thought, GBC, uh, B, uh, Nigerian Broadcasting, they thought Idia Bong, being a disciplinarian, would arrive dead on time. So I was alone as a commentator. But when the, it, it was expected to arrive at uh, five past eight, that day he arrived later. He arrived later, about 20 minutes late. And I was left on air. I didn't have any notes. And I had to talk from my experience talk about discipline, talk about this, talk about that. When I came back to, 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 uh, to Nigerian broadcasting, uh, you know, I had a girlfriend out of that. <laughs> <laughs> Victoria, <laughs> the, an Igbo woman. And she would take me out on the, on the weekends hmm, and introduce me to her friends. This is my friend from Nigeria, <laughs> from, from, Ghana. from Ghana. This is my friend from Ghana. This was, you know, uh, but that was it. Was only friendship. It didn't go beyond that. That's that's a nice one. So, what yeah. advice would you offer to those who are managing football now? Well, they have to clean their heads. I intend visiting sooner than later. I intend visiting the present head of football. Okay. With his name is Keto Fluko. Keto Fluko. I want to visit him. And then we have a little chat. Maybe the little experience that I have, a little, I just give it to him. If he takes it, okay. If he doesn't, he is, in, he is right there. 
you know, and then doing that. When you say they have to clean their hands, what does it mean? Yeah, they should, they should remove prejudice, they should remove hatred, they should remove uh, uh, unnecessary competition, they should, well, and, and anything negative should be out of their heads. Let them think about football and Ghana, and let them say to themselves, we are here to make Ghana great in football, and it will happen. Let them develop positive thinking, positive thinking all the time. They should completely banish the things that, that, have, that have destroyed many things in Ghana today. And i.e. the politics, isn't it? Uh, yeah, the politics. Politics is becoming... Is becoming the Football too is becoming very political. It, it has already become political. It's, it's, everybody is interested in football. People are making money out of it. Except the whole idea, I never made money after football. <laughs> oh, you didn't make money in football? Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't. What happened? My mother told me a good name is better than riches. And I have stuck to that till now. Whether it's good or not, it, um, you ask me, I'll tell you. You never made football, money no, in no, football? No, no, What my, my approach to life generally, including football, is not to struggle for money money at all costs, no, 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 it leads to trouble. So I am as I am, simple man, I have many friends, you know, I was, I was fighting union government with, with uh, President Nana Kufuadu. Oh, really? Yeah, we were together, we were there fighting uh, union, uh, against union government. We wanted pure civilian democratic setup. And it has paid. But, but I'm sure you've, you probably had the life of uh, the, the opportunity of meeting the likes of um, uh, Isa Hayatu, the likes of oh, yeah. uh, Havline. Yeah, who, yeah. In the well, course of in the course of time, in the course of time, during the time they were in office. Yeah. Now they are no longer there. And it's a lesson to all of us. You'll be there. A, Shakespeare said, "The world is a stage." And all the men and women are mere actors. They have their exits and entrances. We should always bear that in mind. There's a time I wouldn't be here. Nobody will talk about me anymore. How many people talk about Kwame Nkrumah today? There are not very many. But he did, we should be singing his praises almost every day. But we're not doing that, you know. He's, he has done his bit and he's gone. Interestingly, there's a secret I have about my connection with Kwame Nkrumah's mother when Kwame Nkrumah died. Read my memoir. You'll get it. <laughs> we definitely will have to read that memo. And uh, your, your life, your, your children also picked up, right? Your, your, your profession. Uh, well, one proud of, of you? One uh, of them. Uh, Jolati Jr. That's right. Uh, we have Jolati Jr. We have. George Latte. Yes, George Latte too. George Latte, he was, uh, he was in the seat. You know, broadcasting can make you frustrated. GBC can, can inject frustration into your veins. But I, from the way things are going, I think they are working hard to correct it. To restructure themselves. Yeah. Broadcast is a job that the welfare of, of the performance should be at the top. Anything else will bring the place down. Anything else. If you forget about the, the performance, the people who really do the job in broadcast, because there's a lot of strain, there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of all sorts of things, you know, and it's up, it's up to the management to be aware of this and not to do paper paperwork. Paperwork, issuing queries and so on, they don't help. You know, so there's a, a there's some element of frustration in GBC and it should be removed. And I think they are working on it. I think so. Final question. Yeah. Do you believe in the foreseeable future Ghana can win the World Cup? Yes, we can. We can, yes. I believe we can. The other day, we nearly won it. We nearly did. Very near. I think the, the one before the last. 
the 2010 World Cup where we made the, the, the quarterfinal. The, the, yeah, the one in which uh, 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 the, the, the maestro, what was his name, shot the ball. At a, at a cross by Samoa Jan. The, the Jan. We nearly, we nearly got into the final stage. Mm. So we can, if only we, 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 we put a few things right, we can win the World Cup. But have you been disappointed that in the last 40 plus years we've not won the African Cup? Yes, it's painful, not disappointed alone. It's painful that we have it. And I think, as I said, if we do, if, if we do a few things right, just a few things right, I think we can. Because football appears to be in our blood. It's part of us. So let's see what, what can be done. I've told you I want to meet uh, the, head, the president, Clay Cook, and then we talk. And I hope sincerely, I pray that, you know, when you are cutting the, the path, when it's crooked, you don't see it. It's the man sitting elsewhere who, so I hope he may take some of the things I'll tell him to her and, and, and act on it. Okay. The other day I listened to a, a speech he was making and I thought it was very fine. Welcome back on the AM show. It's a holiday and I'm coming into your homes with my blunt thoughts. Today I've titled them A Forced Haircut, A New Pipe Dream, and A Cycle of Wastage, Ghana on the Ropes. Of course, like a boxer who is actually getting knocked out. So what do I have to share with you this morning, Ghana for? Since today is Founders Day, let me start off with the Osadifu. Only fitting on a day like this, right? Kwame Nkrumah, during the struggle for independence, once said, and I quote him, and across the parapet, I see the mother of Africa, unity and independence. Her body smeared with the blood of her sons and daughters in their struggle to see her free from the shackles of imperialism. And I could see and hear springing up cities of Ghana, becoming the metropolis of science, learning, scientific agriculture and philosophy. And I hear the mortals resound the echo and the rejoinder. Seek ye first the political kingdom, and all the rest shall be added unto it. Yet the political kingdom of which Nkrumah so passionately spoke has been lost to charlatans, vile and greedy politicians, whose only God is themselves, and whose only oblation or sacrifice are their people. They rob the poor, squeezing them with burdensome taxes. They feed fat of the most vulnerable. They ride in lavish cars and purchase the plushest of real estate. They are nothing less than political vampires, draining the lifeblood of their own people, drop by bitter drop. And Kumar was selfless. Those others who are being forced down our throats today as co-founders were of the same selfish stock we see in power today. And Kumar said, independence now. What did they say? Independence, yes but in the shortest possible time. Independence for them would only be good if it came at a time when they would take over and, so to speak, continue now as the new colonizers to rob their people blind. Why are we so wicked to our fellow man? Go around even urban Accra and look at the squalor in which people live. Look at the sort of ramshackle housing we have. Yet another government puts up a project in Saglemi and we deliberately let it deteriorate so we can sell it off cheap Forgetting that the poor cocoa sellers' taxes, the indirect taxes that hit even that beggar when he bought phone credits, the taxes mopped up from the charcoal seller and the hawker at the Kwame Nkrumah interchange area, who earns his bread day by day, are those that built the edifice. Was it tainted with corruption? Overpriced? Was there anything shady about it? Me, I no bore. Deal with those who committed those atrocities but ensure the edifice benefits the ordinary people at least so it doesn't become a complete waste. But no, 
because of shallow, myopic, self-centered thinking, we have to let it all come down to what we see now, a sad spectacle. And even worse, we then come to say, we are going to put up yet another affordable housing unit in Pukwasi. Affordable to whom? At what cost? How many Ghanaians have family members and renowned architects and funeral donors like Cecilia Dapa does, who can come up with millions of CDs and dollars and euros? How many? These misleaders, eh? These misleaders have got it really cheap in Ghana because when all this idiocy is done, you will find even some ignorant, miseducated, unpatriotic, equally selfish fools coming to defend such arrant nonsense. Let me tell you something. Stupidity and nonsense under the NDC was stupidity and nonsense then, and it is saying now. So too, incompetence under the MPP then and now are just that. Don't mince words. Why we keep pretending black is white baffles me. But if we keep acting like this, misfortune will soon catch up with us. Nkrumah, from some documents I have seen from the First Republic of Ghana, put up 17,132 houses nationwide. And that excludes then those in the 10 uh, communities in Tema, the 9,631 one and two bedroom rentable facilities and the 7,501 three to five bedroom buildings that Ghanaians could procure on higher purchase terms. Just look at those numbers. Some other day, when I can squeeze in a bit more time, I shall give you a breakdown of the specific numbers and the housing units in Asawase, Suntresu North and South, Obwase, Takwa, Bibieni, Akimodan, Kufuridi, Akanda, Kejebi, Jasik, and Salt Pond, Cape Coast, Fantia Boso, Osu New Side, Bolgatanga, Tamale, South Labadi, Kolegono, Kaneshi 1 and 2, Chapel Hill, East Christianburg, North Laboni, Latebi Okoshi, among so many places I could exhaust a full hour mentioning to you. And look at us today. Did we go? Or did we come? The Osajofu Kwame Nkuma did not allocate even one of these houses to himself. Rather, he donated his Pediasi Lodge to Ghana, to all of us, as an act of unerring love, as a gift to his dear country for official use as a presidential lodge. Today, these misleaders retreat to that same venue every now and then with no shame. I listened to Mr. President recently when he spoke of Niger and what is happening there. What did I hear? Grave concern, discomfort, anxiety. I even smelled a bit of fear. Yes, fear. But why will you not be afraid when you make regime security your sole focus and ignore human security needs, pretending here and there? Economic rights are thrown to the dogs, yet you want to be able to sleep at night and break what ate again. That is nonsense. Let's break the nonsense. Let's break the misrule. After you've done that, the people can go on a voting autopilot exercise because we can trust you to steer our affairs. But when even Galamsey has done to us what it has, and you come back and say, we want to break the eight, then it must be that you take ordinary Ghanaians for the biggest of fools at whom you can merely pull the ethnic and the party card and win an election. But we are getting wiser by the day. And like the monkey that says, Bibian to Mimi, Bibian to Mimi, your caps will be full sooner rather than later. You claim your administration has created so many jobs, yet where are the returns? Why the unemployment bulge, which is at its height? I spoke to a friend of mine who has worked for many years in Burkina Faso and other African countries, and who recently got another major appointment and moved to Lagos, Nigeria. Thanks to his job outside Ghana, which pays him very well, he's building a house somewhere here in Accra. And when I say well-paying, it's because what he does is one of those few jobs where even here in Ghana, if you contract people to do that for you at an event, you'd have to pay in dollars or other hard currency or its equivalent. So don't get me wrong. He's not been to the site where the house is being put up, partly because he's out of Ghana for most parts of the year. And he only lets someone inspect the place and tidy up from time to time. Recently, when he came to Ghana right before taking up his appointment in Lagos, he went there and found to his absolute horror that all the wiring that had been done on the near-completed house had been stolen. We're talking of cost of wiring and workmanship hovering around 80,000 Ghana cities. Gone. The youth have no jobs, so they will risk their lives to do wicked things like that. I'm not justifying what they did, but what I am saying that when you push people to the wall, they either crumble and die or find a way of breaking through the wall, employing tactics legal or illegal alike. Your Sajjo for Kwame Nkrumah did his absolute best for Ghana. Can these misleaders today 
beat their chests and say in all honesty that they are doing same. If we could see the loot that many, not all of them, but many have stashed away, we would be shell-shocked. But like we say here, every day for thief man, one day for master. The master's day will surely come at some point, whether here or in the afterlife. But come it will. My heart bleeds for Ghana and what has become of it. My heart bleeds for the teeming youth with all their creative energies, yet with nothing to do by way of work in this suffocating, nepotistic, and chronistic economy. Now we hear, you know, Dr. Amin Adam saying the IPBs can either accept government's haircut or forfeit their money altogether. Wow. Okafu di diampa. I'm as well 24 7. We hear Nista Bon Proud. Share. Mumu nse muma MPP wate. Mumpini omwe. Ayo. Eba. Neyo. Nkroba never dies. Ghana will not perish. Ghana will live on. From the ashes of misleadership will arise the phoenix of a much better Ghana someday. Before I proceed, let me just come to what Dr. Amin Adam has been saying before I wrap this morning. If you look at the second round of the DDEP, and I'll be going very quickly on this, it's going to cover energy sector independent power producers, cocoa bills, and they have resisted this fiercely. They say they are not going to partake in it. And that is what we heard. Now, Dr. Amin Adam says, you either accept it or maybe risk losing everything. Okay, let's see how that pans out. Cocoa bills, local U.S. dollar-denominated bonds, and the Bank of Ghana non-tradable debt. Let's go to the next slide. Now, taking a haircut, government says it is unable to pay energy sector debt. Restructuring is necessary. The IPPs are not unique and must undergo debt restructuring. I see. You've forgotten the contract you had with them. Next slide. But, Eli, Eli Plim, Chief Executive of the Chamber of Independent Power Producers. This is what he says. IPP has made its position emphatically with regard to the debt restructuring that we are not open to that. We are open to a discussion that focuses on the payment plan of our arrears. Next slide. And then we come to other business. Ken Oforiata, our finance minister. We have turned the corner. Which of them? Which corner have we turned? Next slide. Then you look at our budget projections versus mid-year revisions, and it makes for a sad story. Imagine this being the script of your child in school. Wasi. Overall real GDP, 2.8%. Revised budget, 1.5%. Inflation target, 18.9%, 31.3%. Gross international reserves, not less than 3.3 months cover. That's where we are, 0.8 months cover. Primary balance, 0.7% of the surplus. We are 0.5% deficit. And expenditure allocation, 227.7 billion, 206 billion. Next slide. Now, if you look at the divisions in terms of the score, end December inflation rate deviated. So, clear score there, F9. F, fail. Gross international reserves, 67.5%. Favorable, B3. Overall real GDP growth, 53.44, C6. It's, it's, it's okay, still. Total expenditure commitment basis. Ahonso, Yare Poto, F9. Non-oil real GDP growth, there it is. And then you come to crucial areas like primary balance on commitment basis. We deviated. Overall budget deficit, that one is like a song we keep singing. Overall budget deficit, cash basis, also deviated. Three F9s. If you have a student with the exception of total revenue and grants here, that A1, it will not get you into any institution in Ghana with one, two, three, four F9s. Your aggregate will be 32. Four F9s. And this is what we are turning the corner with. Next slide. In terms of our National Affordable Housing Program, I've spoken to you about it and what Nkrumah did and the nonsense we are displaying now. Regime after regime. I'm not just talking about the MPP now. The thing we've been doing with this affordable housing, it's so shocking. And now you leave Saklemi and you say you are going to Pukwase. God be with you. It entails the construction of 14,000 housing units, 8,000 units in the greater Accra region, and 6,000 in the Ashanti region. The project infrastructure will cost government $47 million, while the private entities take the rest of the cost. Ghana 4. 
And then we hear from Francis Asensu Boache, Minister for Works and Housing. It will cost $140 million to make the Saglemi housing project habitable. When you leave it for the time you did, and it becomes what it has become, why would it not cost you that much money? But the private developer can take care of it, right? The project lacked proper feasibility studies. I see. Saglemi should be completed by private entities who have... Fine. It is my prayer that with the Pukwase one, all these things are in there because if they are not, you will have a very hard time. <clears throat> As I wrap, I want to give you hope. You see, like Rocky Dawuni shares in his song, I've been listening to it throughout this morning. Even my production team has been listening to it. I may not sound like Rocky, but I picked a few words from the start, the middle, just in there. When he says, time now for jubilation. Oh God, I wish I had an answer. Cause in sweet love, our spirits will grow. So brothers be jamming. Yes, we be jamming. We'll be jamming till they're hiding. Oppress a man running while we're jumping. We'll be jamming today. So say it's love from Rasta in Ghana. We're stopping all the suffering in Ghana. I say it's love from Africa in Ghana. That just seals and signs and delivers. Take heart, my people. I know you are knocking on the doors of despondency and hopelessness. But I want to leave you with this quote by Pitacus Law who says, When you have lost hope, you have lost everything. And when you think all is lost, when all is dire and bleak, there is always hope. Let us pray that God raises our flag, the red, the gold, and the green, and that we become indeed that black yet brightly shining star of Africa and the whole world. I wish you all Ghana for a happy Founders Day with an apostrophe S. My name is Benjamin Akako, and these are my blunt thoughts shared with you, raw, hot, and edited, and diluted. God richly bless our homeland Ghana and make her great and strong. Well, thank you for staying with us on the AM show. You know, here, we are blunt. We say it as it is. You like it, you don't like it. I meet a lot of people out there who say this or that, but we, we do what we do because we're passionate about the brand called Ghana, the red, gold, green, and the black. But as we continue today on Founders Day, we want to have a conversation on Ghana. Everything Ghana, as much as we can, with our guests. Now, in the studio... We have Dr. Abu Sakara Foster. He's founder, National Interest Movement. Uh, he joins the conversation. He's also the 2012 presidential candidate, Convention People's Party. He's here with us in the studio. And uh, we have other guests that we'll be introducing to you shortly. But I'll start with Dr. Abu Sakara Foster. Thank you, Doc. Ben, good morning. Good morning. And yes. happy holiday. A happy holiday to you. And congratulations once again on Founders apostrophe S day. Yes, I, I was about to stress that. For me, it's a founder for yes, me, and yes. it will always be apostrophe S, one yes. founder for me. Uh, well, you can't, you can't force me to... Uh, you know, the sun rises from the east and mm -hmm. sets, in, sets the in the west. If we decide to call the west, the east-west, mm. it will still rise from the same place. Nothing will change. Nothing will change. So uh, I don't even believe uh, that... Every Founders Day, that should be the focus yeah. of our, you know, discussion. What is the state of the founding? Yeah. Where have we got to? And uh, what has it been worth? And what, it, what will it be worth in the future? Those are the areas that we should be talking about. Mm -hmm. A reflection of Founders Day, of the sacrifices people made, and whether we are making it worthwhile to have made those sacrifices. Those are the issues that we should be talking about today. Uh, and I believe that uh, we'll have a good conversation on that. <laughs> let's, let's talk about, you've, you've lived for a very long time mm. in this country. Indeed. You've, you've... Uh, since 2005, 
Right. And then, of course, until I was 12, before yeah. I went abroad yeah. Uh, yeah. for yeah. my studies in the UK, I was here. And of course, even during my entire 27 year professional life, I mm. kept coming back, back and forth. Mm made sure that my kids at least went to school here for about five years yeah. to make at them properly Ghanaian. Yeah. And they have schoolmates. And that's very important because otherwise you grow up as a... It's an integral <laughs> part of socialization <laughs> Absolutely. that people often... Absolutely. And then when they've been there for so long, yeah. become, they become odd. They, yeah. you, know, you, know, you know that thing about secondary school? Yes. SHS yes. all of that. Yes. If you miss certain things, yes. it, it's difficult to integrate moving on. Absolutely. You don't have... I mean, I go to places and... Oh, you're an old vandal. Yeah, sham. You know, that kind of thing, that camaraderie. Yes. And no, if you don't have that, yeah. it's problematic. It's, it's important. And also it's important for people's sense of identity True. to know where they come from. And uh, one thing that provoked this, and it's good to tell it on Founders Day, mm -hmm. was that we had uh, our national football team come to Zambia. And okay. of course, we, the expatriates, we received them. We made a long convoy of 50 cars, made noise, took them to the stadium. But we fed them fufu beforehand and we were beating 2-1. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Even Kaunda got up to come and see who was, how a few Ghanaians were managing kind of to do dominate the whole stadium. Wow. So we went home with our tails between our legs mm. and it was all quiet. In those days, it was fantastic to beat the Black Stars, you know. Uh, was that before the days was, of uh, these were the Kalusha 80s. Mwalia? Yeah, uh, these were the 80s. At that time, okay. Kalusha was a young Kalusha man. Kalusha was you young. Know? Yeah. And uh, the next day, for having beaten Black Stars, not one Kafo, just beating Black Stars, they gave them a float along Cairo Road, going wow. up and down. People were jubilating. And all my staff in the office went to the window to watch the float. So when I came out, they all went back to that. I said, no, go ahead. So I went home early, only for my daughter to rush home. Daddy, 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 yesterday we beat Ghana 2 1. <laughs> and I told my wife, it's time for her to it's go. It's time home. for her to go to Ghana. <laughs> now she's identifying <laughs> with the Zambians. Yes, because oh. you identify with wherever you live, you see. Yeah. So it's very important uh, to, to, to ground them. Mm. And I think that sense of grounding is good not only for the younger people, but also for ourselves. Mm. At this stage, when there's so much confusion in the world, uh, all the things that we held sacred are no longer sacred. Yeah. It's good the world is almost on, on its head. It's, Top seat, it's a topsy-turvy world. Absolutely. Now, absolutely. everything, it's almost as though everything you knew mm -hmm. was no longer yeah. like, the, it's as though the f script had oh, been yes. flipped. Yes. And now you're reading things. Yes. You know, the, the, fundamental, converse, the fundamentals converse, have man. caught up with us. Yeah. <laughs> the fundamentals, fundamentals have caught up with us. I like that play of words. But, but speaking of the fundamentals, yes. I was deliberately talking about how much time you had spent in the country because mm. you are not one of those. Yes, you've been out there, mm -hmm. but you've spent substantial yes. you know, yes. lengths of years yes. Yes. in Absolutely. Ghana. Yes. You've seen many regimes, mm -hmm. many governments mm. come and go. Mm. And I call what we see now a misleadership. Mm. What do you see in Ghana today? You've lived in other countries, comparatively. What do you see in Ghana? And again, comparatively, with everything we've been blessed with. Sometimes you struggle to find what Ghana doesn't have. Small country, yet we have everything from water resources, mineral resources. Now we've even discovered lithium. We have iron. We have bauxite. We have everything. And the human resource, thankfully, we have a large population, a youthful, vibrant population, yet... Look at where we are. And I have this document, Ghana at 100. As the conversation goes on, mm. I will share some of what our aspirations are mm. and run them by you, wh 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 whether yeah. you think these are even feasible on our trajectory. Mm. But what do you see when you picture Ghana today? I see a glowing ember. A glowing ember? Of a flame that was once bright. But nonetheless, it is still there glowing in the dark. And all we need to do is reignite it nation will achieve what it's supposed to achieve. But if there is no attempt to reignite it, then we have a problem. Because the glowing ember will dim and dim and dim. And the fewer people that see it, the less hope they have of reigniting the nation back on the course to putting it where it's supposed to be. Many of the people that I have been here with have left. Some came and left. Some came, stayed for a while. Your contemporaries. And left. Yes. Uh, and expatriates left who came. And, you know, and there was a time. Mm. I must tell you this. There was a time 
when, as an expatriate community in the diaspora, we felt Ghana was abandoned. Then, over a period, we came to a stage where now Ghana was ready to take off. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like a plane sitting on the tarmac, mm -hmm. waiting uh, to be given just the clearance. Just spreading itself, yeah. Then, slowly, 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 the air hostesses got down. The pilot got down. Even the wheels of the plane were removed. Mm -hmm. The drinks were taken to kiosks to serve people. And the passengers began thinking, maybe it's time to get out of the plane. Mm -hmm. Because that time when we felt Ghana was about to take off, that time when we felt that if you don't come here, you miss out on something, you know, that time has passed. Mm. Now people are telling their kids who are abroad, don't come home, stay where you are. Oh, yeah, that's the rhetoric you know? though. I mean, let's I speak be to a lot of people yes. and they are, in fact, I have colleagues, I say yes. it all the time. Yes. Some of my colleagues, yes. my, my contemporaries, yeah. These are doctors, yes. nurses, yes. pharmacists, yes. accountants, yes. engineers yes. who have all left the shores of yes. Ghana. Yes. Sometimes they tell me, ah, Ben, you have all these linguistic mm. talents, mm. all these languages mm. in your mm. toolbox, mm. French, Spanish, Portuguese, a bit mm. of this and that, mm. German. You, you, you have law, you have political science, international relations, mm. a bit of the business. Why are you still in Ghana? Well, it's, it's, it's <laughs> always difficult explaining to them because they, they in a way, they yeah. see it as a bit of, yeah. where you make a crack? It's yeah. a bit of, yeah. Well, it's, it's difficult. It's, no, it's not that. I mean, when you walk into this studio, you smell the air of patriotism. That is why you are still here, you know? And the truth of the matter is, if you won't pound the fufu, who should pound the fufu for you to come and eat? It? That's the question. So some people have to do it. And I think that people who have been blessed, who have the opportunity, uh, should invest more here. It's very sad for me when I look at the profiles of many countries to see that the richest people do not invest in yeah. the productive sectors of the economy. Yeah. They rather actually keep, safely keep the money in trading or put it outside. We have to create the atmosphere where people invest here. And the biggest investment that you can make in Ghana is your children. You know, when you encourage your children to come back here and because of who they are, their name or the political color people have put on them, they cannot f achieve their full potential because they're always cramped, you know, not given opportunities uh, because of the right political coloring or because of the right ethnic background. Then they begin to wonder, why am I here? You see, so those are the things that we have to get rid of. And when we talk about Founders Day, we have to remember how we were founded. When we were founded, we were given a sense of nationhood, mm. where everybody was the same. Whatever we say about that period, we cannot deny the fact that that first republic created the most patriotic group of Ghanaians. True. At the same time... Unrivaled. At the same time, it also contained the biggest betrayals yeah. of the nation. Yeah. You know? So... This mixture is always there, and it is the yin and the yang, <laughs> and you always have to strive to make sure that the, the strive for the common good overcomes those who are working for the selfish parochial interests. And that is why it is very important at this time, to, in this, on this Founders Day, to think carefully about the kind of democracy that we have. Is this is the state of our nation. What are the prime driving factors that have brought us there? And we all know that it is the kind of adversarial democracy that we chose to adopt. Right from the foundings of this nation, people couldn't agree. And the storyline goes that there's so much disagreement, we have to break the pot and make it again. So how do you carry water if you are willing to break the pot because you don't like the color of the pot? And these are stories that must be told in their real context so that people get it clear in their head that it is never a good idea to break the pot from which you drink just because you have a disagreement. Mm. All around us now, we see fires, Burkina, <clears throat> Mali, Niger, etc. Why is this happening? Why are people choosing to re-break 
the, uh, the, the, and, and, the, the and that's an interesting bit yes. because it started in the 60s yeah. post Ghana's independence yeah, stopped for a while 66 yeah. February the 24th yeah. yes. and then there was a bit of a, you know there was a trend yes and it stopped I mean yes. up to the 80s yes. these things were yes. still happening yes. then that was cut started again and then it, it appears across the swathes of yeah. countries yeah. across the continent yeah. started adopting yes. democratic yes. dispensation yes. subscribing yes. to the ideals of yes. democracy yes. and then all of a sudden it has started again it tells you that the people have lost something that democracy has failed us. Democracy has failed us. That the kind of democracy we have chosen to practice has failed us. Why? It has led to exclusion. It has led to disempowerment of the masses. It has led to a very extremely partisan uh, society and polarized society. And it has led, led to the cultivation of an elite political class who have an entrenched self-interest in the preservation of the status quo, mm. thereby eliminating possibilities for a change in the status quo through the democratic process. Mm. And when that happens, it becomes like a volcano where there are no dikes. There's only the central chamber. You know, democracy is like the dikes in a volcano. When mm. the pressure builds up, it diverts it into the dikes. But, but when there are, there are no, no dikes, dikes and the dikes are all blocked, it blows the top of the the, the, the mountain off. And that is a process that whether you like it or not will happen. And we have to think of our society as human beings in a laboratory. Just like you have physical reactions, chemical reactions, you have social reactions. If the society is managed in a certain way and frustrations are pent up and opportunities are denied and there is an elite class suppressing the rest of the people, then, of course, you'll get certain reactions. It's a standard. It happens everywhere. It doesn't matter about the color of the people. It doesn't matter about their ideology, et cetera. And these are- That was the, the reaction we saw with the Arab Spring. Yes. Those are some of the reactions Absolutely. we're seeing in other African Absolutely. countries. Absolutely. So these are things that we should reflect on deeply on Founders' Day. Where are we? What is the pressure in the, in the nation? Are we giving the right kind of vents for these pressures to be released? Are we creating opportunities for other people to feel included? And is the political system delivering? Or has it just become a dance in the park? Before I move on to Dr. Hassan Sumaila uh, Mohammed, he's a development expert at the UDS. Before I get to him, just on something you said, I want you to quickly talk about it. You say democracy has failed. I said the kind of democracy that we are practicing has failed us. Okay, yes. because we know of that ideal democracy of the people, but, by the people, for the people. Yes. The question is, is it of the people yeah, really? Is exactly. it by the people? Exactly. Is it for the people? Yes. But, but I'll ask you then, if not democracy, then what? Well, this is why we have to redefine. You see, it's not a question of democracy or something else. If the kind of democracy you're practicing has failed you, that is a very partisan democracy creating this elite blockade, then you have to redefine that democracy so that it works for all of us and not just for a few of us. And the only way of doing that in a proper legal manner within a democratic society <coughs> is to pursue the legislative route. We have to make sure that people are sent to parliament, not to represent parties, but to represent people. So we have to start building a cadre of independent parliamentary candidates that can go to parliament as independent parliamentary candidates on a reform agenda and fight for that agenda tooth and nail. Mm. And if, as you have seen in this particular dispensation, just one <coughs> MP <coughs> is able to hold sway in parliament, can you imagine what five seasoned, substantive, self-made uh, parliamentarians will do in a, in a parliament that is very close? Can you imagine the agendas that they will change? But if we all put this aside, and every day people are running up the ramp, uh, wanting to achieve the presidential, wanting to achieve the presidential and falling back, then nothing is going on at the parliamentary. And that is the beginning of the place where we need to redefine the democracy. So as we are going into this election, I am hoping that we will have a body of people that are thinking critically about how we redefine this democracy through seeking a group of independent parliamentary candidates, self-made people, <laughs> you and me, yeah. people committed uh, to a reform agenda, 
and so that we can have the kind of reforms we want. Listen, it will not be overnight. Anybody who promises you that there will be a substantive overnight change, you know, is, has smoked something this morning. <laughs> Are you with me? Unless of the kind that we don't want, <laughs> you know? But if we begin the process as a journey that will take time, but we will achieve significant results step by step. They say the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Right. And the fact of the matter is that going quickly in the wrong direction is much worse than going slowly in the right direction. Mm. Interesting words, food for thought. Let me bring in uh, Dr. Asaya Sumaila Mohammed. We're also joined by Dr. Asaya Sante, and uh, he is a political scientist and head of the Center for European Studies at the University of Ghana. But to you, Dr. Asaya Sumaila Mohammed, this fourth Republican experiment, we've had the first Republic, second Republic, third Republic. Now this is the fourth Republic, the longest we have had, uninterrupted. What do you make of it? Has the Fourth Republic delivered? And on a day like this, when we celebrate for me, the Osadifu, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and the others, who by, because there were even women who aided this cause, and some people spilled their blood. We say Nkrumah never dies, but I'm putting it practically to you. Nkrumah's dream for Ghana I think, is dead in the water. And some people subscribe to that. So does Nkrumah live on after all? I know uh, Dr. Abu Sakara Foster will have a take on that, but that, that'll be later. To you now, uh, Dr. Asa. You would have to unmute, uh, sir. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so good morning and then Happy Founders Day to all and my senior, Dr. Kwame Asante, and all. Good morning, sir. Good. Uh, very interesting day and a very interesting topic. Uh, I think we have been discussing this issue for a very long time now. And then the purpose of our discussions has only been bordered on the challenges that we, as a nation, we have not been able to do the right thing to become a nation. I've always tried to go little to um, a little political science and uh, prop will correct me. But at independence, the two things that you achieve is sovereignty and power to control your resources. And we're in the hands of the colonialists who by the purpose of colonialism came and then conquered us in our minds and in our administration and control our resources and that was the purpose of colonialism to extract and then go and build their nations we thought at the point uh, led by our founders and then the leaders of our our country and then being masterminded by Kwame Kuma that we needed to stop that because we as human beings on earth also thought that it was important to control our resources and have an identity and that identity that we now call Ghana was to make us proud that we belong to a section of the world and therefore we can control our resources and develop ourselves. Now, after independence, the purpose of independence is where we are now struggling for. Yes, the founders of this nation and led by the ideals of Kwame Nkrumah got it right that after independence, you needed to change the ideology of the people in this country. And then I'm young, probably did not have the opportunity to attend those ideological institutes, but we had, mm. and then those ideological institutes were there to establish and then imbibe in the citizens, the culture of citizenship and the sense of ownership of that sovereign nation that we are called we acquired from the colonialists. That particular moment was the moment that we needed to continue. The longevity of that period was the challenge. We were not able to elongate the process of inculcating into the citizens to have that feeling and ownership of the nation. Now, somebody asked me somewhere, does anything called Ghana exist in us? That question is a very quite tricky 
when you wake up in the morning and then they say, or somebody say you have won a jackpot, $1 million, not to go into the one that was found in the bed somewhere, $1 million, and they ask you, what will you do with it? Many Ghanaians will not mention to pay tax. They will probably go straight to buying a house in the UK or in Europe. That is where we are getting it wrong. Now, the state is our own. Then understanding of what is Ghana among Ghanaians, we have a challenge. Because one, if you say you're a Ghanaian, it means that you own the Ghana. If anybody is found to be stealing money from Ghana, you'll be angry with that person, even if it's your father or your mother. Because collectively, we have contributed to gather that resources, whether from sale of our gold, diamond, uh, forest uh, resources, or oil, or any source of funds that comes into this country. It's for we Ghanaians. But unfortunately, we don't have that in mind. So if somebody is found to be corrupt and then he's stealing money, and then you are the beneficiary of it, you say hallelujah. So unfortunately, the ownership of the state or the nation called Ghana is seen more as an abstract, but not a reality. And that's where we're getting it problematic in our current practice of democracy, because it is like winner take all. So if you are able to win power, then you, and, uh, you, you, you have absolute control of the resources and you will now decide what you want to do with it among your cronies. It's, and like, it's, it's like they will teach you in political science. There's this, um, I think Dr. Asa Asante will be able to uh, get it for me, who says, then you get to determine who gets what, when and how. When and how. <laughs> how. Exactly. Our last well. Yes, and last well. <laughs> and yes, and it continues like that. So now the question is, I, 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 I share a simple uh, experience that has guided my thoughts for a very long time. I worked more with the NGOs in the past, with Care International, with uh, the EU, and a number of I mean, programs. And there was one particular incident. I visited a colleague. He was, I mean, he came to Ghana. I, at the time, I did my national service at Kotka International Airport. Mm. And I had access to going to the, 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 the arrival, departure. And this particular time he came and then he came with some two phones. When he came with the two phones, I was able to go to the Kotoka International Airport. And then with my relationship there, I got him out with the phones. Apparently he was bringing the phones for his girlfriend. What did I do? I aided him to evade tax. Is that not so? <laughs> this same person, I went to Denmark. This same person that I visited in Denmark, we were to take a train, a, sorry, a tram rather, from one point to the other. In fact, we got it wrong. We didn't buy the full ticket. So we bought a ticket and when we got there, he said, no, we needed to go to the next stop. Then I said, oh, then we are just moving to the next stop. He said, no, we need to buy the ticket again because if you don't do that, the trains cannot run. You know what he was telling me? That I was stupid and I was really a stupid man. I felt stupid at that material moment because I never protected Ghana when he was in Ghana. Mm. So that is in us. And among a lot of us, you have been given the responsibility to guide how much gold is taken from Ghana. They give you a V8 and then $100,000, and it's enough to allow the mining company to underdeclare how much gold is taken from Ghana. And that's what is happening. I don't think... You, you, we, 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 we debate about this. Oh, no, we, we shouldn't because, I mean, there have been times when even one country like India or the UAE will say, this is what we got from Ghana by way of gold in a year. And yet our total year exports of gold to the whole world will not amount to that. So you ask yourself, where, where did where it go? Where did they get it? Mm. So these are the things. So I'm saying that at independence, the power that was given to us or the power that we receive from the colonialists was to allow us to have control of our resources and our destiny. And that's why along the line, we started thinking of, about, uh, what do you call it, uh, decentralization, uh, started thinking of development planning, we instituted the National Development Planning Commission, so we're able to plan our resources so that we have a destiny. Now, you ask the question, I was in a uh, conference in, in, in Germany uh, about four years ago, and you know what? We're thinking about how Germany can 
plant their energy in 200 years. 200 years? 200 years. And just a few years you know, ago, when we were talking about planning for 40 years, we were told we are, exactly. looking too, we are looking too far into the future. Exactly. And let me just tell you the basis for that. Now, Germany at a point has been relying on what we call lignite. Mm. Lignite is the next stage to coal in the formation of the hydrocarbon. Now, lignite, if you take, let's say, one room full of lignite, you get the same energy like one bucket full of coal. Now, Germany had been mining the, the lignite, and they realized that if they allow the lignite to stay there, in the next 200 years' time, it will turn to coal. So if you go to Europe, and in Germany in particular, you see them having a lot of alternative energy. And that's why this Russia-Ukraine uh, issue, and then Germany, you, cannot under, you understand that Germany will not uh, really uh, push far because they rely on a lot on... Uh, on, uh, on, uh, on Russia for gas, which is another source of energy. But apart from that, they have a lot of alternative energy sources like wind and everything. Now, they are, what are they thinking about? 200 years for the sovereignty of Germany to become dominant in the energy sector in the world. And Russia is controlling the world because they have power of their, of their resources. Mm. Now, at independence, <clears throat> what did we do? We, we initiated all this. Nkrumah tried it. Nkrumah said, look, the independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it's linked up to a total, uh, what do you call it, liberation, liberation of, of the Africa. African continent. Because Africa, naturally, by God's creation, is endowed with a lot of resources. And therefore, Africa needed not to go anywhere to look for any alternative energy. Unfortunately, we are going around looking for alternative energy. River Congo was going to give us a lot of power. But even within Ghana, look at the plants in Kuruma had. The Bui had the power. Look how long we took before we constructed the Bui. Another alternative one at uh, Palgu, we are I mean, playing uh, chess with it and then playing football with it. And every, today, no funding. Tomorrow, no funding. Meanwhile, every day, every year, we complain. Next month, we start complaining about the Baghdad down spillage. So the question is, do we have an agenda as a group of people to also dominate another group of people. That's another point I want to come in. In the development history and development theories, what we come to realize in the, in, is that any country that is developed or is in the path of development have always thought of also dominating another person. Just think about it. Any nation that is seen today as powerful has at point in time led by its people, visionary people, thought of also dominating another country in terms of resources. Britain did it, and then that was the theory of colonialism. Why did they go to colonize Africa or other parts of the world? They moved from the theory of mercantilism. They were doing merchant businesses, and then they were going around. They realized that while they were going around selling their merchant merchandise, <coughs> they saw other resources in other countries. And therefore, they realized that those countries were weak in terms of culture, and they can change their ideologies. So they started coming in with the theory of what? colonialism, which was, con which was powered by anthropology. Uh, um, because Doc, Doc, I'm sorry I have to do this, but because we also have a bit of a time situation, uh, just yeah. round up so that I can also bring in uh, Dr. Kwame Asasante. Okay, so hmm. what I'm trying to say is that a group of people decided to uh, uh, look for independence. The purpose was clear that can have control of your resources and then have agenda for your generations to come. So that your generations will also become powerful and respected in the world. Unfortunately, after achieving the independence, the generations or those who took over after Nkwame Nkrumah thought that Ghana was not a place to live their lives. So a lot of politicians come and take the money and rather find their way in Europe and America to go and have their homes. That ideology of seeing Ghana as a place to go and harvest and go somewhere to live it's where we are today. Mm. Let me now bring in Dr. Kwame Asasante. I would like your take on the Fourth Republican experiment and that tag, Nkrumah never dies. But I am positing this morning that with the death, maybe physically we remember him, but with the death of his dream for Ghana, maybe that dream is dead in the water. And maybe with Nkrumah together, with it. What are your quick thoughts on that? Because I want 
quick reflections, and then I'll take you into the Ghana at 100 document so that all of us can get into it. I, many people don't have this. They don't know what even the plan is. But if this is our plan and we find ourselves where we are, how do we get there? Like Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew. How do we do it? So let's start with the fourth Republican experiment and whether Nkrumah's dream is still alive. Doc. Um, ben, good morning to you and good morning uh, to your viewers. Can you hear me? Is it okay? It's okay now. It was patchy at first, but it was Hello? halting. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Right. Good morning to you and good morning to my colleague, Dr. Asa, very close. Uh, colleague, and then uh, the rest of your viewers. I must say that I support and I, I acknowledge uh, the place of Nkrumah in the life of Ghana. Nkrumah, the statement that Nkrumah never dies is not that an description of what Nkrumah was and continue to remain in the annals of this country, I have no doubt in my mind. But before also intro, uh, throw into this conversation about the Founders' Day, it is a beautiful concept, but I think that uh, I acknowledge the immense contribution of Nkrumah and how far he has brought us. There's no doubt, and his contribution can never be shown under the carpet. But there are others who also contributed the same uh, towards the cause of what freedom and the cause of building a better society for ourselves that we we'll call today the modern Ghana. We can what make mention of a few people because time will not permit us to go through the whole gamut of all those who contributed. But one of the people whose contribution must be recognized and acknowledged by the people of this country is King Agri, who was a king of Cape Coast, who stood his ground firm that he would not allow the British uh, to have their way in what Cape Coast, that the Cape Coast belonged to what the, the Fanti people, nothing more, nothing less, thing for him, independence, and of course, a better Ghana one day. That this person was grabbed, taken to Sierra Leone, manhandled, and they brought him only to, for him to come and die. Nobody has acknowledged Kenagri. It's unfortunate. And if this country wants to make sure that people emulate their leaders and contribute their quota effectively towards the building of this country, people like Agri must be what acknowledge. That, that, that's, uh, people just, like just, a, just, a quick, just a quick who point. Organize uh, a lot of people. Uh, just, just a quick point. I just wanted to say that does acknowledging them necessarily mean we, we must have founders yes. with with an S and all of that? There are look at places like China. Look at many other jurisdictions. They celebrate one person. It's not to say that it is that one person who. I mean, gave birth to everything and that everything is around that person. But in this context, it's been, the picture has been painted that some people brought Nkrumah into the country and all of that. And so some of these things cannot be overlooked. I was mentioning earlier, Doc, that even there were women who supported, women, they are rarely acknowledged, who supported through their money, through different industrial you know, mechanisms, the cause of independence, yet they are not celebrated. I mean, we could, then the list would be endless. Uh, there is a need not to celebrate them. My whole conversation is that, however small the contribution of others, it must be acknowledged. That is important. So we are saying that when we single out in Chroma, and then it becomes a little of a difficulty, even though acknowledge the immense contribution of Kwame Nkrumah towards the building of, you know, the modern Ghana. I have no doubt in my mind. But I want the same to be extended to others who also contributed, such as what Nikwa Braboni, who... Mm. Doc, are you done with that submission? Okay, the, the, the connection is, is frozen. So we'll try to reconnect. Maybe if we can get him on the phone, I don't know which would, which would work better. But uh, Dr. Asa, Dr. Abu Sakara Foster, let me read. So Ghana mm -hmm. is 66. Mm -hmm. In 2057, 34 years' time, we'll be 100. Imagine a 100-year-old Dr. Abu Sakara Foster, a 100-year-old Dr. Asa Sumaila Mohammed, a 100-year-old Dr. Asa Santi, a 100-year-old... Benjamin Akaku, what would you aspire to? What would you have wanted to, 
maybe have achieved as a person. And then let's put it side by side with the portrait of Ghana. This is a document I'm reading from the NDPC, among others, and following through the Fourth Republic, what the plan should be. Now pay attention. By 2057, the document says, it is envisioned that Ghana will be a high-income country with the following minimum characteristics. This is the bottom line. One, self-confident citizens with high standards of patriotism, anchored and discipline, good work ethic, who put the welfare of country above self-interest. Two, nominal GDP of approximately, this will get you, $3.4 trillion and per capita GDP of not less than $50,000 equivalent. Resilient, service-oriented, industrialized, and globally competitive economy. A business and financial hub in the West African sub-region. Modernized agriculture. Minimal in income disparities. Robust pension schemes. Affordable and di diversified. I am just truncating some of them. Energy supply. And this one really got me interested. Effective efficient, dynamic, and inclusive institutions that ensure accountability, integrity, and transparency with negligible levels of corruption. This is nine out of the 18 that are listed. Well, I what think, do you think? First of all, when we talk about Ghana at 100, it's really not about us. Mm. It's about our successor generations and what life will be like for them. And it is our opportunity now make that life as good for them as possible at that time. So the decisions that we make now is really what will be reflected there. And therefore, in looking at this uh, uh, vision for Ghana at, 60, at 100, which is really a plan, uh, the question then is, where are we now? What are the things we are aspiring to? And what is stopping us from getting there? And how can we make up that gap? The fact of the matter is that some of the targets that you have mentioned are clearly now not achievable uh, because if you have I mean, if you look at our if you have GDP, a GDP now GDP of 80 something it, it billion is, it is less than you're it's about, about 2.9% of trillions. what this figure is yeah so how, how do you make that gap if in 66 years it has taken you that time to get to 80, 80 billion how do you then jump in 40 years to trillions 34 you know years, so so that that is a big issue and what have you done now to lay the foundation for you to make those uh, jumps. Other issues related to welfare of people, etc. If now we see that most of the economy is you know, outside uh, uh, the formal sector, uh, how much of it will be coming into the formal sector so that all that planning actually is addressing things? Instead of you making plans, that is address not addressing the larger body of things outside it. So that is also important. Uh, if you talk about inclusiveness, uh, we have drifted towards a, a situation in a democracy in which a lot of people are excluded. You only go to cast your vote. And essentially, people are saying, look, they're not even interested in voting anymore because it makes no difference. Of course, we can't have a democracy which survives like that. We have to rekindle it and open avenues so that people feel that, you know, my vote is worth something, even if it is just on MPs who are able to uh, hammer on your particular cause and get it heard in Parliament. Mm -hmm. Now, these are things that we need to orchestrate. If we don't orchestrate them, it is not going to happen. Okay. And there has to be the commitment to do it, and there has to be the resolve to do it. That resolve is not seen when we are steeped in corruption. That resolve is not seen when we are steeped in an electoral process that is driven by money, that resolve is not seen when you have a system that excludes so many people from poor backgrounds. Mm. God does not distribute brains according to the money in the parents' bank account. He endows each person with his own opportunity. And when a country is not tapping the brains of its poorer people, it is losing out a lot because you don't know who is going to be the next Einstein. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and that is the whole point. Yeah. Let, let me bring in Dr. Asante back into the conversation, even as I also walk through some others that are put here for uh, that we can aspire to. 
Efficient, affordable, and equitable first-class social services at all levels. Social services. Low levels of unemployment and underemployment with decent work opportunities for all. Maximum application of science, technology, and innovation in every facet of society. And l let me leave this for now. Sustainably managed land, forest, water, air, and biological resources. Now look at our water bodies. Look at Galamse and what it's doing to us. Dr. Kwame Asante, back to you now on the phone. Yes. Um, I want to take the opportunity to uh, deal with the first part you put to me, but because of network challenges. Can I come to it quickly before I... Yes, very quickly, mind? Doc. Right. If you look at uh, the question of the Fourth Republic and how far we have come in terms of uh, the ideas or the aspirations of those who founded Ghana, all right, I can say without your contradiction that we have deviated from what the founders set for this country. We're looking for two main things, political freedom, economic freedom, and then to be boxed up with what? Social freedom. Let's look at the issue of political freedom. Yes, um, issue of what? Uh, freedom is a, a very difficult commodity to come by in this country. Uh, we pay lip service. Uh, our actions and our what? Inactions uh, point to the fact that we are not ready uh, to allow freedom to exist in this country. There have been all manner of efforts that we have done through what, you know, covert and obert means to prevent people from enjoying the freedom that uh, their forefathers envisaged for this country. Issue of justice. Is that, is that something that uh, we can be proud of in this country? We have had challenges. If you read the literature from what, the think tanks and all that. Yes, uh, justice we have, but with some difficulties. How far have we done or, or contributed to dealing with this problem? Issue of governance. It's a problem that you have leaders who are arrogating to themselves all powers, powers that they even don't have, where constitution prescribes them from or prevent them from exercising certain type of powers and all that. They move beyond this because uh, the constitution is tailor-made for them and they do what uh, it pleases them issue of what probity and accountability because within the the political freedom we're looking at what issue of what probity and accountability we've made it what fine you know document that is the constitution and if you look at the preamble of the constitution probity is a part of what the preamble but are we ready for probity are we ready for accountability and all that anytime people take on people who hold political power uh, that it, the, the conversation is that it's from opposition and it's from people who are disgranted and the rest of them. Uh, but uh, issue of what? Human rights. Do we have that, the, the, the ability for people to develop, to become the best of themselves for the society? Is that a case that we have here? There are people, any time uh, it rains, they have no place to lay their heads. But it's a basic human right, the right to shelter. People don't have water to drink. And from the Fourth Republic up to date, there are a lot of places like that. People go and fetch water at places where animals also go to drink water. Right. Right. Society. So all to look at that. Look at the economic freedom. Is that what we, our leaders envisage for us? We envisage a society where we'll be able to what, uh, put all our resources together and manage in such a way that it will improve the lives of people. What are we saying? We have to move on from, you know, from that time and then, you know, going down on the line of what poverty. We are in abject poverty. Issue of the economy has never been uh, very strong for this country, and mm. then it has affected means of livelihood <clears throat> for people. Look at the young people parading the streets of Ghana without jobs, and all that we hear from government is nothing but rhetoric and banding the whole place up with figures that do not make sense to anybody. Right. Uh, the issue of what you know, um, development. All right. A, a government will come to office develop a plan that will help us to what, chart a path of development. It will be thrown away in the name of what, for political expediency and all that. Are we doing a service to the dreams and aspiration of what <clears throat> our forefathers? Is it the case? I, I strongly believe that it's not the case. Let, 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 let me just do this. I mean, our time has basically run out, but as we conclude, uh, and I'll start with you, Dr. Asa, when you look at the vision again, 
It couches it, Ghana the rising star, Ghana at 100 vision, democratic, inclusive, self-reliant development country by 2057. There are four pillars, and these are the pillars. Government, peace, and security pillar. I, I will not elaborate. Economic pillar. You can imagine what will be under that. Social pillar. And then environmental pillar to, you know, protect our environment and ensure that it is managed in a sustainable way. What do you see currently and how do we improve it in simple terms to make Ghana that krabeshe, that land of promise that we all want it to be? Dr. Asa, so I think I'll apportion it a minute to each of you and uh, we can wrap. Ob obviously, this is a conversation that we'll always have a lot more time for. Dr. Asa Asmaila. Again, you have to unmute. I would say, as the German, Germans did, after the Germans broke up and then united, and then after they lost the Second World War, they told themselves that they've lost the war. They admitted that they lost the war, and that was the beginning of the reconstruction of Germany. And then it's from 1994 up to date, when they united, Germany is the largest economy in Europe. At a point in time, we have to agree that we have failed. We have a lot of challenges in our development our trajectory and an agenda. Let us pause. Let us restart the thinking and then the conversation. Let us agree that we have made a lot of mistakes. Let's pause and point out where we have made the mistakes and correct ourselves and start. I don't think Ghana is for we those living today. It's for the future and the future to come. Let us create the opportunity for the future, I mean, the citizens to come and take over as in Kuruma and Code did. We, right. at the point, truncated their agenda, and then we are at where we are today. Mm. And in doing so, one of the key things I think we have to understand is that... D gentlemen, God one minute, created, please. So try and manage, manage the time. One minute, so try and manage. And gave us the, all the resources that we made mention of. <clears throat> Let's see how best we can judiciously use them. Don't let strangers come and steal our gold and then pollute our water. You talk about the environment and all these we need to look at. One important, I cannot stop without saying, is to reduce the expensive democracy that we are running. Mm. Be frank with you, the troubles that we have today are as a result of the fact that people spend so much to get to power and then they must steal the state resources to pay back their loans or whatever they got their money from. So people go to work in public service as ministers or political appointees, not because they love Ghana, but because they have seen that it's an opportunity to make right. money. People who by their individual selves could not raise a thousand Ghana cities, today are raising millions of dollars. Mm. I don't think they are getting those money from anywhere. What you and I, we needed to use to solve all the problems that we have talked about, the youth unemployment and all those ones, creating of the jobs and all that. How can you allow one person to make that money. You know what the person is doing? Okay, Dr. Uh, uh, thank you. If, if we, I, I see your passion, but we have to end okay. it at some point. But I think we get the thrust of what you're saying. Dr. Busakara Foster, interestingly, he talks about future generations. In Norway, they have a fund, I think, since the 90s that has been there for future generations, the oil uh, resources and all of that. They are thinking of the future. Here, even the future, we are destroying now. Your, your last words. First of all, uh, we have to accept that as a successor generation to the founders, we have not lived up to expectations. We have fallen far behind the expected schedule. The reasons for this are clear to us. We have been willful, self-indulgent, and at the end of the day, concerned only with self-gratification now. Those things don't make for patriotic nation building whether you call it ideology A or ideology B, they are racked with indiscipline, theft, and a lack of ability to stick at the job. Right. Now, what we need, must do now, you, the younger generation, those of us in our 60s, we have only 20% shares left in the company called Ghana. Hmm. At most, we get to our 80s. Those of you who are younger, who have the majority shareholding in the company called Ghana, stop asking the older people what to do with it. You are the majority shareholders. Take a grip, 
and make sure that we change the trajectory of this Ghana. And we do it using the democracy we have, but fighting very hard to make sure that the legislation, the legislature performs its duty. Okay. So more of you should get into parliament, not on the backs of political parties where you'll be whipped into line with whatever the executive wants, but go there as independents, community representatives, talk to the people, convince them that we are ready. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting thoughts you've shared. Uh, let, I'll wrap with you, Dr. Asa Asante. You also have a minute, and then we draw the curtains on the conversation. When you look at uh, the few thematic areas you give up, that governance, economic, uh, independence, uh, issue of... Um, Social, and then environment. And then environment. I will want to look at it this way, that you need the ABC of all. One is the accountability, that having all the ideas, the dreams, and aspirations, and all that, you need leaders must be what accountable for what they do, that for whatever they do one day, they have to uh, account. Once we begin to have that family place in our mind, we begin to work at it, and the end result will be what? Efficiency and productivity. We need so governance aspect, we need to get all the basics right and then make sure that we are accountable. We are accountable. The B is what? Getting all the basics of all that we are talking. Basics of governance, the right formula is there for everybody to see. We choose the one that will work and this part of what? Getting the basics right and then for what? The economy, for social, and then for the environment. And then what? The C is that we must be consistent of what we are doing with the hope of what realizing our vision once we get this abc what uh, right through all these what thematic area i'm sure at the end of the day the story will be different and ghana will be better off ghana dache and that is what we pray for uh, ghana the land of the warrior king that, that is our name it's a powerful name land of the warrior king and um here we are we can't even fight our own battles. We need the IMF every now and then to fight for us. Joining us for this conversation, we had Dr. Abu Sakara Foster. He's beaming at me right now, founder, National Interest uh, Movement. We also had uh, joining the conversation Dr. Asa Sumaila Mohammed, development expert at the University for Development Studies, and Dr. Kwame Asa Santi, a political scientist with the University of Ghana. Now, stay with us. Coming up next, we have a conversation with translight solar they'll be telling us a lot about what they've been up to we'll be right back Welcome back on the AM show and we're going to be talking lights, lighting, energy up next as we host Robert Kojo Ohin, marketing manager at Translight Solar. If you've been in this country for long enough, about the last 10 years, you would know how important it is for us to be having this conversation. Mr. Ohin, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. How are you doing? I'm okay. It's a holiday. I, I would have wanted to be somewhere, you know, relaxing. But both of us are here for business reasons. Rightly so. Yeah. yeah. But tell us a bit about your outfit, uh, Translite uh, Solar. How long have you been around? Okay, so Translite Solar started in 2014. 2014? Yes, yes. Commercially, we entered the market. I'll so give or take some nine years 2015, ago. yes. Just about some nine years ago. We've been offering clean, affordable, and reliable um, energy solutions for um, residential purposes commercial and also rural installa installations. Mm. That has really been our business over the last couple of years. And, and what is the terrain? I mean, what would you say the terrain has been like over okay. these years? So, you know, um, somewhere 2015, 2016, we were made to believe there was a major power crisis. <laughs> um, popular you were made as, to believe. Popularly known as Doom So, <laughs> so um, during that time, you know, there were a lot of power, power challenges and people really couldn't, um, I mean, trust the grid so much. So. It gave rise to the business in a sense that we were selling backup solutions for homes. Okay. So, I mean, the market was opening up for that kind of business. But it evolved after two years, two to three years, and we entered into the commercial space, and we've been doing excellently since then. 
Okay, so tell us, break down for us, for those who are watching you and probably getting excited already, what are your core operations as Translight Solar? What are your core operations? Okay, so we are, we are really a solar installation company, okay. and then we focus largely on um, residential solutions, and um, commercial ones as well for businesses, um, small businesses, industries, and quite recently we started doing a lot of work in rural um, communities where we are providing solutions for them to um, have access to clean water and enough water for the farmers to um, farm all year round through irrigation purposes. So um, um, and we've also done a lot of mini grids in villages where um, there's no light at all. So they have like power now. They could even dream of it having power over the last um, couple of years, but so far it's been very good. Mm. Now, solar, I mean, a lot of us talk about solar. My, my church has solar. Uh, I know schools that are starting projects with solar, but someone may sit somewhere and not have a proper concept of what solar energy or harnessing it is all about. Yeah. Explain to us. Okay. So the way that it works is um, during the day, um, the, there's a lot of sun hitting the surface of your solar panels, and this converts this power into electricity through cables, um, and, and by the way, those of you watching, uh, if you're looking at the background, those are some of, that's what some of the panels look like. Yeah, so it trans transmits this energy through cables into a smart device called an inverter. So this inverter is like the brain of the solar system. It's programmed in such a way that it always chooses the cheapest source of electricity. Mm -hmm. So primarily in your home, it means that solar, most of the time, is the primary source of electricity for the home and the cheapest one. After that, you have the grid, then you have batteries as well. So in an event where um, it's, 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 it's late in the night and you realize that there's no sun shining, one would ask, how then am I going to get power? ECG would now become your backup and you have your batteries working for you up until about 11, 12 o'clock where um, it, that cycle ends and we store about 50% power in the batteries such that when the light goes off between 12 and 6 a.m., right. you have at least some power, some power to carry you through the night. In the morning, the sun comes up and kicks in again. That cycle just continues all around. Mm. But, you know, most people would be thinking, and, and that, that's a good image we're showing there of, you know, an example of how we can harness solar uh, technology. You want an interrupted power supply, but you also want it cheap yes. at an affordable, you know, rate. Is that possible with solar? Because a lot of the time, once you think solar, people say, hey, I don't know what they know. Tell us, what is the reality? Yes, so it's actually very possible to save on the cost of electricity and possible to also have uninterrupted power supply. So in an event where um, during the day, solar takes over the, the electricity provision in the home, you realize that at night, the batteries are also there. So it means that the only time you may possibly be using ECG, since it's now your backup, will probably be in the night, mm. between 11 and 6 a.m. So that way, all the power you are generating during the day is catered for by solar. Mm. So it means that we have an example of a customer who was paying about 2,000 Ghana cities for electricity bills. After monthly? This, yes, monthly. After solar installation, it dropped to about 200. That's, and this, that's, this is that's significant, a factor of 1 to 10. Significant savings. Wow. But, but talk of the initial bit when you're starting, because yeah. I guess that's where the devil is. Yeah. What is it like when, when you're starting off on solar? It's, it's a bit cost-intensive, right? I, I would not want to call it the devil yet, because, um, yes, people um, from time to time complain about the initial cost. But you have to look at it as an investment because it's definitely going to pay off. With the current um, bills, maybe, for example, the customer was paying 2,000. In about two years, you would have paid off the system. And still, right. your bills would drop to 200. So that's significant savings. You really have to think about a long-term solution of getting solar, which will help you in your day-to-day -day operations now. Because now it looks like um, people just have the misconception that it's expensive, but that's not really what it is. It's mm. really a good investment, and I would, I would entreat everyone looking to have alternative power. And, I mean, solar is their primary source of electricity in their home to actually consider doing that now. And you know, what comes to mind, like you mentioned an inverter, there are many gadgets from fridges to yeah. air conditioners yeah. to others. You can choose the option with an inverter. It will cost you more. That gadget, you can get an AC without an inverter, an AC with an inverter. The one with an inverter will cost pretty much more, yeah. but over time, it will save you a lot more in terms of cost yeah. on electricity. So yeah. it's, it's a similar yeah. uh, technology. Yeah. But in terms of the, the residential market in Ghana, what are the financing opportunities available? I mean, a lot of these real estate, I'm sure they'd be interested, and yeah. if they could harness that, they would also be able to cut down on the cost of even those who will purchase. Uh, yeah. So uh, with regards to the residential market, 
it's actually been a very tough market in the Ghanaian solar industry. And um, as a company, we've, been, we've evolved over the last couple of years to try and understand the markets better. So um, formerly, the, the banks were not so supportive, but now um, the market has opened up. Even now, the banks have like a green desk, and they are able to support people who want to invest in solar. There are also funds um, from outside Ghana that are purposely for um, investing in solar. So now there's, there are a lot of green opportunities. Green energy. About yes, that. there are a lot of opportunities for them. And in-house as a company, Translite, we, we came up with a model where we, um, we are offering a lease-to-own solution for um, residential customers, where um, we have given them a period to pay for the system, maybe one year, two years. But then um, there's a little caveat there. You probably, so if you're an, a human resource manager watching me now and you, you're looking for solar solutions for your staff, I think you should get in touch with us because it will be very easy for us to work with you to um, get your staff to um, sign on on our lease to own program. Mm. In terms of what you've done over these last eight to nine years, what would you say has been your proudest moment as an entity, Translite Solar? Wow, we, we have a lot of things to um, be thankful for. Um, so um, top among them is we recently finished um, constructing a solar-powered powered vessel. Um, that's really the first in Ghana. Oh, wow. Well, we, solar-powered vessel? Yes. Where yes, is yes. that? So um, I don't know if you ever heard of this story about a lady who um, swam like the full length of the Akosumbo. Um, I heard something about that. Yes, 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 yes. So she, she got off that boat. To, um, I mean, into the water and all of that. So that was also re strictly for research purposes. We did it for a customer wow. somewhere in Adabraka. That's what's shown on the screen now. Yeah. yeah. And then also, ah, we also, um, we take pride in saying we are really the number one solar installation company in Ghana because um, we've done well over 5,000 systems. We provide solutions for rural, rural, um, rural services such that people are able to have access to clean water and the farmers are able to farm all year round because we are providing irrigation services for them. Farmer, formerly, they were only planting and sowing their crops when it was like the rainy season, but now they have access to water to um, channel or help all those things to um, work out for them. Mm. So, I, I mean, we can't do this without also adding. Someone is watching us right now. I mean, I, I am interested. I'm sure other people are interested as well. How can they, if they want to get a solar system in place, in their home, at the office, at some location, how do they go about it with Translite Solar? What do they have to do? Yes, so, um, well, because I'm here today, I would want to say that the first 20 people to call us would get a, 20. a special discount from Translite. But you need to make reference to um, Joy News so okay. that we can, we, can, we can give you a very good package. And so um, I would say that the number for um, the company is... 050-424-9229. I'll go over that again. 050-424-9229. And 020-654-2454. A bit slower with the number. Again. 020-654-254. And 050-4249-229. You can call us now, and the first 20 people, we have a special package for you. And a lot of the businesses that are looking to also cut down the cost of electricity, we have very good deals for you in the industries. There's no reason why one shouldn't do solar when you, if, if you are working primarily during the day, mm. from eight to five, because those are like the peak hours of the sun. So I mean, a customer is paying about 100,000 Ghana cities, and they work only during the day. And we're able to save them as much as, um, I mean, their bills are able to drop to as low as 15,000 Ghana cities. Wow. Yes, and that, that's significant savings. Save of 85,000. savings, yes. And now there are a lot of, like I said earlier, a lot of financiers who are ready to pump money into solar. So these industries are probably going to get about 7 to 15 years um, payment plan so that they can um, invest in solar now mm. and spread the payments over a period. There, there are a lot of funds available and they are looking for people to um, put, put, put that investment in. Could you? Thanks for coming. Thank and, you too, Ben. Uh, we can only pray for the best. I mean, even as a country, we are seeking alternative sources of energy. So solar is one of them. Rightly and so. wish you the best at Translite Solar on this journey. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for coming. You're welcome. Robert Kujohin is Marketing Manager with Translite Solar. He joined us for uh, this conversation about Translite uh, Solar. But stick and stay with us. Up next, we have that conversation coming up on the University of Education, uh, Weneba. We're hosting the Graduate Students Association of Ghana 
uh, and uh, that chapter as well. So just stick and stay. We'll be right back. Well, we're talking about the Graduate Students Association of Ghana, UEW chapter, and uh, they have this international multidisciplinary conference for postgraduate students coming up. The theme, Paradigm Shift in Pedagogical Innovation for Transformative Education. Now, to help us wrap our minds around this theme, we have Ransford. Uh, Samovi, I hope I didn't murder the name. He will, he will correct me if I, the Grassack president yeah. from the University of Education, whatever. And then Akudubu Isaka, immediate past Grassack president. I'm on it because I have current president, <laughs> past president. Hey, I'm a big man. Oh, okay. So, Ransford and my brother, a very good morning to you. How are you? Ah, very well, very well. Um, I was just sharing with them. I'll, I'll expose myself. I was telling them about how tired I am this morning <laughs> and everything. But this is what we also contribute mm. uh, to our motherland. So let's 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 look at this uh, conference that is coming up. I'll start with you, Ransford, and tell us a bit about it. What what is it about? All this right, multidisciplinary uh, conference. Okay, so thank you very much for for, for giving me the opportunity. I want to first of all. Uh, uh, greet all postgraduate students of UW and UW uh, students as well for, for watching us. They are really watching us this morning. Mm. So we are basically having this seventh edition of the conference. Seventh? This, yes, okay. yes. This conference has been running since 2016. What we, our predecessors believed was that as postgraduate students, it is a bedrock of research, and everything research is about postgraduate students. So we felt that we need to get a platform that will help us discuss national issues, especially relating to education, and digest, get papers, research that has gone into education and all those stuff, and get a platform for all these people to present these papers and profess solutions to some of the issues that is confronting us as a nation. So that is their brain, technically, behind getting us this conference. And this conference is very international. It's international. Since the inception of it, we have been inviting uh, guest speakers across the country. And this year is no exception. Like, we, we have, the, the conference is obviously going to be hosted by the Vi Vice Chancellor of University of Education, Professor Mauta Avoke who has been playing a very keen role in the it's, success it's interesting, of, right? of, of, of this name yes, coming yes, up yes. again and yes. the history in this, behind. In this conference, <laughs> very, very uh, key role. And then we are also going to be inviting the German ambassador, His Excellency Daniel Kuro, okay. who is also going to uh, be the keynote speaker for this conference. And then we have Professor Edward Apia, the Director General, National Council for Curriculum and Assessment. And then we have... Because you're talking of pedagogy. Yes, yes, yes. Curricular so assessment. Will definitely. Be. And then we have uh, Professor Dr. Telsi, who is coming from Hamburg University, Germany. Uh, and then we have uh, Professor Douglas D. Ajay, not forgetting our own uh, Professor uh, S. K. Asi Eduardo, who is the planning committee chairperson. And then uh, Professor Ariesu Braima, who is also... Uh, graduate uh, dean for the School of Business for University of Education. These are very power-packed professors and, I mean, academicians who are coming to help us digest these issues about education. So this, 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 this is something very good for, for postgraduate students across the country. Mm. And then we all need it, to... It, it, it looks like a very high-powered power team yeah. yes. that you've put together from the German ambassador, mm. His Excellency, uh, Mr. Mr. Krull, mm. to all these other academicians mm. who are coming on board. But coming back to you, Akudugu, you have been there, you have done that. In fact, he took over from you. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you have also held this before. Yes, please. Last this, is, this is the seventh installment. So you hosted the sixth yes, one, right? Yes, yes. What, what have the developments been? Because we always build upon 
what we've had. What, what was it during your time, and what are you hoping this year, as you host this conference, will be the add-on to uh, this conference? Great. So, thank you for the opportunity once again. Um, like you stated earlier, this is an international multidisciplinary conference meant as a platform for academia and academic knowledge. So, last year, the conference went very successful, and at the end of it, we had a post-conference analysis where we looked at some of the, the papers that were submitted and some of the, you know, the speeches that was made. Then at the end of it, we prepare a composite post-conference analysis document where we make that document available to policy implementers, at least to shape policy use it mm. in implementing policy across the educational setup and our development as a nation. So we are hoping that this year conference to once we are done, we'll be able to do a post-conference analysis and then get some of the issues that were presented that we'll use it for our national development. Some of the issues within the educational sector mm. that the conference would have raised it, they would have used it to develop you know, our educational sector and resolve some of the challenges confronting the educational sector. What, what are some of the, and I'll ask both of you, I mean, I'll throw the ball to both of you. Mm. What are some of those core challenges? Because when it comes to pedagogy from different different levels, different facets of the chain. Mm. There are so many problems. What are some of those that, I mean, you're looking forward to seeing them highlight as you host right. this conference? Uh, I'll start with you so, and then come so to you. So if, if you quite remember, you realize that when we were hit by COVID, mm. the methods, pedagogy, and everything that we used to teach yeah. got truncated, and we needed to, as a matter of urgency, whether we like it or not, to devise some solutions. Now virtual has come to stay. Very well. So this is, the, this is where we are coming from. So now we are talking about the pedagogy. What ways are we going to employ? Now that we know COVID has taught us, taught us a lesson, what are some of the things that we should be beginning to be thinking about as a country so that we, we don't get ourselves in any unforeseen event and we don't know what, what because since COVID, hits us, we have not been able to recover our academic calendar. Yeah. Yes. They threw it out of Yes, because, now it's because but other nations have been able to do away with it, and they are running normal. But now we, our academic calendar has shifted drastically, and then we are still forcing to get it. I feel if we have those pedagogies in place as a country, we would have turned things around quickly. So these are some of the research we are encouraging colleagues, postgraduate students across the country to bring. Let's digest it. What are some of the ways that we can look at in going forward so that in case we have any unforeseen events, we are readily available because we have policies, we have things in place that we can be running as a country. Okay. This is what we want to do. Mm. Good. So, like you stated, if you, look, if you take a careful look at our curriculum as a country, especially the ones we are implementing at the basic level now, see that there are challenges with the curriculum implementation now relative to the models, especially some of the materials available. Mm. So some aspect of the conference where we want to look at is that what are the, some of the teaching methods? Does it really, you know, go concurrent to the realities on the ground? Do they reflect the, the realities? realities on the ground? Because the basic education level is very key and very fundamental in our educational growth as a country. And so we are expecting that after this conference, key issues will be able to raise as to relative to our curriculum development as a country and its implementation process. Because once we get that right, I can assure you that our educational system as a country as we have it now will be very well shaped. Okay. And we will move forward. And so this conference basically will do that and will produce a post-conference you know, mm -hmm. document. We have to go now, but just to wrap the conversation, I, I'm just imagining, while I was speaking to you, mm -hmm. imagining this on a national level, rather than just... Yes. I'm leaving you with food for thought. So as as you engage your other it's, it's uh, very, it's leaders national. and all the of that. The abstract that we, we took from this conference okay. ran from the United States of America, some of the universities, Hamburg University, okay. uh, KN University, mm -hmm. UCC, and this okay, so it has that something, yes, already. every every other university has okay. is taking a keen interest in this, in, okay. uh, this conference. All right. Yeah. So when is it happening? Just give us those core details and then we can run off. Yeah, so it's, it's hap it starts, the registration will start uh, this Wednesday, that is on the 9th 
of, on the 9th yeah, of August, the 9th. yes. Yeah. So we then register conference, those who want to come and participate and all that mm. will come and then uh, come and register. And then the official opening is going to happen on the, uh, the 11th, which is th uh, 10th, sure. sorry, 10th. So after the... So that will be a Friday. Food, yes, yes. Then we'll break into the sessions and have our various presentation and research that we, abstract that we took, people present it and we have uh, guest um, uh, moderators that are going to critique some of the work and then we have the comment. So then we continue on the, the following day, the 11th. Then we also continue with the presentation sessions and all those stuff. So if you are uh, interested in joining this, uh, uh, participating in this conference, it's just a good uh, 100 cities and then just for mobilization yeah. and all that stuff. And then if you are a UW student, obviously it's going to be go for a, a cool tw uh, 25 cities. Okay. Then you get a very good okay. certificate for yourself and all those okay. stuff. So I think this is something that we are inviting the whole uh, country to, to take a very keen interest in and come to UW this Wednesday, uh, Thursday, and Friday. And, and I, I can trust you, uh, they can trust you that they are not going to leave the empty headed or they are going to be fully loaded mm. before they leave. Well, gentlemen, this is where we'll have to cap it off. But uh, I couldn't also fail to notice that we are all in a butter color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> lovely, I, lovely colors. We are, we are in, in Ghana. It's a holiday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, that was uh, Ransford Samovi, Grasak President, UEW, and uh, Akurugu Isaka, immediate past Grasak President, UEW. On now, up next, we're going to be telling you about Joy Prime's Big Chef program. Big Chef Tertiary is a culinary reality show that airs on Joy Prime TV every Sunday at 5 p.m. That is up next. Well, this is how we wrap uh, the show this morning. We're going to be talking about culinary delights. It's all about Big Chef. And they are whetting my appetite already because me, are they here, Charlie, are they hungry right now? And we have chefs in the studio. Let me introduce to you Chef Samuel Anaman. He's a judge on Big Chef. And we also have Chef Tracy Oredu Abebio, also a judge on Big Chef. Thank you for joining. Thank you for having us here. We have about... Five to six minutes to run away. Okay. So I just want us to do the slip step. But I'm curious, what made you accept to be judges on Big Chef? Okay, so I believe in mentorship. I believe in impacting knowledge. Okay. okay. And the reality is whatever you learn from school is different from what you practice in the industry. So we want to blend the two. Okay. They are students, they are in the in the, they are in the schools and they are learning. But they need to be open to what we have. In the industry that is where we come in and that was one of the motivations why i joined why i joined um coming on this show mm. yeah and for you yeah what's so, the motivation all right so i me per se because i know i have a lot to give to the young ones and the hospitality industry i was so honored when i was invited to be a judge for this because uh, the impartation part is very um important to me because yes, so that you, you want to share. You want exactly, exactly. That's, that's, that's so great. But at the same time, while you impart, sometimes hey, you, you can cut them, slice, dice. <laughs> like you can give it to them. Not after your well, well, No. Sometimes you are so hard on them. Why? Okay. <laughs> so with with we are not hard on them. You need to. Be you are. Oh. <laughs> for those of us who watch from, really? hey, you need to, the thing is that you need to be very disciplined as a chef. Okay. Without discipline, you can't be a chef. Mm. And that is what. That is where we come in, okay. so that they know what. So standards. Doing. Yes, standards, and that is what is in the industry. When a chef is there and is commanding you, not commanding, instructing you to do something, you need to do it because the guest does not really care what happens at the back end. Yeah. All he cares is that his food is good, and it's the duty of the chef to make sure that all the units, everybody is on point, mm. so that the guest experience with the meal will be perfect. And that's a solid point. Not, not also to forget that food 
health, safety. So you must ensure that exactly. standards are rigorously followed. You give someone food poisoning or something like that, and disaster ah. strikes. Yeah, I get it. But let's 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 look at what the experience has been like so far as judges. Uh, it has been so. It has been so great. It has been so great. You know, our expectation from the beginning wasn't that with with a student, but as the week goes by. Um, so far, so good. Things are working the way okay. we wanted. So I can see the expectations is, is getting there. Are they improving their yes. culinary skills? Are sure. they improving? In fact, sure. Well, sure. for me, I have been a TA before uh, in one of the oh, okay. universities. So I had a new choice. Which one? I no, okay, and I want to close that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had a neutral, a neutral uh, expectations <laughs> for them. But as day in, day in and day out, yeah. we're mentoring them, they are improving. And I will say kudos to the, all the technical universities that brought their students to this show. Mm -hmm. They are doing so well, but there's a lot that needs to be done. They need to bring they the So, so that's, I, I was about to get to that. Mm -hmm. Are they meeting your expectations? Are they, are they following? Yes, yes. So far, so far, far, so good. But I would, I, would, I would be happy for the technical universities to send their students into the industry so that they know what is happening in there. The thing is that when it comes to the theory part, you could tell that they are like on yeah, okay. top of it. Yeah. But it's different. But application. But application. application. Yeah. The knowledge and wisdom are two different things. Two different and things. Knowledge and application. Exactly. exactly. So they should come into the industry more so that they see whatever is going out there so that before they even come out from school, mm. they, are ready, they are ready for the market. Okay. Tracy, so to both of you as we wrap the conversation, we've had five episodes so okay. far. There are many more to come before the season closes. Yeah. What, what can our viewers expect on Joy Prime every Sunday at 5 p.m. when uh, they tune in to watch Big Chef? And we have big chefs in there. Okay, so, <laughs> These are uh, major chefs. Yeah, <laughs> so they should, they should not expect anything but the best. The education, innovation, and uh, the skills in there. Skills. Yeah. Like some kechebu. Exactly. Of course. Kechebu there's, there's, there's a whole yeah. lot of things in there. So just don't say, just tune in every Sunday at 5 p.m. There's a lot. But Sunday, you'll be amazed. Just stay in. After church, glue after getting your fufu. Just chalk and wait. So what, what I would add to what Chef Tracy said is, we are bringing reality from the back end of the kitchen mm. to the viewers. Okay. So that you will see what your meal goes through, yeah. right. the processes your meal goes through before your meal gets to you in the restaurant. So please do watch Big Chef Teshari and you will not regret it. The okay. biggest reality show in Ghana. Biggest reality yeah. show in Ghana. Yeah. And as for the culinary shows, this one, it's, it's beyond Atichi. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but for me, the only thing I would want to leave you with, maybe before I take your final message, um, I want to be in there somewhere. And uh, all I want is to eat the food, sample. That's oh, okay. That, I, I want to do it's that done. for you. It's done. <laughs> done. Eh? It is done. <laughs> final message, 10 seconds each. Starting okay. with you. Okay. So final message, I would say that glue to Joy Prime and you will not regret. You? I would say Big Chef Tashari, the kitchen has no boundary. And this comes your way every Sunday at 5 p.m. Just stay tuned. Thank you, Chef Tracy Oredu Abebio. She's a judge uh, with a uh, big uh, chef. Pardon me. I've... Chef Samuel Anaman also joining the conversation uh, this morning. Thank you uh, so much. Right before we go, happy birthday to Margaret Ama Sam, the mother of my troublesome producer, Derek Ekwasam. Trouble is his middle name. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's an old vandal just as I am. He's a wonderful fella and he ensures that things go well. It's from Felix, uh, from Sam and the kids, Sarah, Ekwasam, Barbara and Janet. We love you, mommy. We too. We love you so much. We are grateful that you gave us Echo with his big head like mine. Anyway, this is how we wrap the AM show this morning. Up next, join News Desk. Yes, with yours truly. We'll be right back.